And once I understand who they are, now I can identify their strengths and weaknesses, especially under pressure, because it's different. When they're not under pressure, they might be world beaters. But if I can create an environment where they feel pressure, they go into that fight, flight, or freeze response, mm -hmm. now they're a whole different athlete. And you gotta keep track of both how they play under and with pressure. That's right, so you can recognize it, because uh -huh. they're not always gonna be under pressure. And that's, that's what, I think that's what um, fools a lot of athletes and, and coaches and everything else is, you'll have your team, they'll be winning, they'll be doing great, and then the wheels fall off, and they look like different people. Well, they are. And the reason is, is, is this uh, polyvagal theory. We think it's psychological, oh, something's going on in their mind, no. They're having a nervous system response, a fear response. They, they have a perception that their safety's at risk. Mm -hmm. And now they, because their safety's at risk, they go into the lizard brain. Mm -hmm. There's only about 5% blood flow going to the prefrontal cortex. They can't think. Mm -hmm. So whatever they could do before, they're not there. They're literally having a nervous system response, fight, run away, or freeze. You become a okay, caveman. You become, that's it. <laughs>
had some massage, some good food, <laughs> ready to go. That's always good. So there's probably a million different ways to introduce you uh, for our listeners, but I'm gonna, and you're gonna get to introduce yourself a little bit, which okay. I've seen in videos that you're good at. Uh, <laughs> I don't <laughs> know if you. you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of videos where you have this um, 30 second, uh, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, you are, um, Purely from my standpoint, your when I started playing beach volleyball, I think that's about six years ago. At this point, um, I went on YouTube and I started looking for uh, videos and information and tutorials. And yeah. uh, you were basically the guy that I watched the most. That's, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's humbling, <laughs> and it uh, it's been a while since I made videos, so. I, and I don't get that sort of feedback, so thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it was because, um, yeah, it goes into the backstory of my whole project and everything. Uh, I did other things, I did uh, singing lessons online before I started Beach Volvo, oh, wow. and there was such good information, so when I started Beach Volvo, I was like, yeah, I'll just go online and find the info and, and learn it, you know? Okay. And then I went online and I just got, like, there's nothing out there. Uh, there was some. And, and the best, like, because I was really looking into, like, in-depth kind of stuff and, uh, and your videos were basically, I don't know how much it was Andor's ideas and how much it was yours and there was some sort of collaboration. It was, yeah, so Andor is a friend of mine and um, he asked me to do it. I was in L.A. at the time uh -huh. and then when I went to Canada, he's like, we need to do some more. So I only did a few. We, uh -huh. did, we did a whole series while I was, while I was in L.A., but... Um, my aspiration is to do like a whole series. I've just never gotten around to it. Uh -huh. Because like you say, there's nothing really there. Exactly. And so when we started in 95, 95 we started trying to do some research. Um, Phil Moreland, who was with our team, did our research and our data. Uh, he's also our physiotherapist, man of many hats. And uh, <laughs> he went online and he couldn't, he couldn't find anything. There was indoor, yeah, yeah, but yeah. he couldn't find anything for beach. So we had to start creating our own. Uh huh. Yeah. Because you know, <laughs> there. exactly. It's, so, it's really interesting, but and even today, like you say, it's not a whole lot that's, I don't know, maybe innovative and uh, really digs into it and that you can use to learn. Quickly. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I I started my project out of frustration because I wasn't able to find the answers I was looking for, and then I started basically unraveling some answers myself, and then I was like, hmm, maybe this is interesting for people, so yeah. I started making videos about them. Okay. Cool. <laughs> but so, so for me, okay, so uh, I saw, in, saw you on YouTube years ago, and then, you know, you were some coach in Canada that made good videos. Yeah. Uh, never saw you again, never heard about you again. Yeah. And yesterday I walk on the beach and there's some guy <laughs> shaking my know. hand saying, <laughs> it's yeah. Steve. And I was like, really? I think I recognize this, this voice and this. <laughs> you had yeah. glasses on, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I can't even, maybe that's 15 years ago. It's, it's been a long time. Maybe 12, 15 years ago is when I made those videos. I'm not even sure. But, you know. yeah. yeah, it's overdue. I need to do more. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that was uh, really <laughs> fun for me. I mean, I didn't expect that from from a random Wednesday night, but there you go. That's what happened. And of course, I had to ask you, hey, do you want to be a part of the podcast? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would regret it otherwise. I love doing this because, well, first of all, I had mentors, mm -hmm. and some of them they never asked for money or anything. And one in particular, a guy named Mark Barber, coached. Uh, Ken Steffes and Karch Karai at the 96 Olympics. And he just coached a bunch of guys in, in LA. Never, never charged, it was really interesting. It was just his passion. And he just asked me one day, he's like, look, just pass this on. Don't let it end with you. So mm -hmm. every time I get a chance to share it, I'm like honoring my mentor. Okay. Yeah, so that's why I like to share. And people who are passionate, you know, they say don't, uh, don't give your goal to a fool. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anybody who's passionate about it, passionate about learning, um, committed, I don't care at what level, uh -huh. I'm in, man. I'm in. Okay, that's keep it going. fucking amazing. Yeah, because uh, they'll keep it going too, right? Exactly. Like you're yeah. sharing this. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's hopefully the there's a lot of, uh, if I know my audience well, they're, they're passionate people that are really hungry for information. So, yeah. So we should, 
I think there's going to be good ears listening to this stuff. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do you want to um, introduce yourself uh, slightly more? That was my um, my approach yeah. to knowing who you are. <laughs> yeah, I've had to learn how to do this because you know you want to be humble and all that sort of stuff, but really it does a disservice because then people don't know who you are and what you do, and I've hidden quite well. You know, uh -huh. it's um, so um, yeah, I've been coaching for coaching since I was 18, so 39 years. Um, and I started coaching professionally on the Women's Pro Tour in LA, it used to be the WPVA, mm -hmm. Women's Pro Volleyball Association. And it went bankrupt and then the pro women went to the AVP. So the AVP women used to be the WPVA. Uh -huh. And I coached there for five years, 1990 to 95. Then I worked with the first uh, Swiss women's team which was Marianne Bollinger and Mimi Buffa, which we stole from basketball okay. in Switzerland. <laughs> so we we're based in Lausanne. I was there for, I don't know, a month and a half, two months. And uh, they played in the first FIVB event. And, um, and I worked with Marianne and several partners after, and they, you know, that was, that was good. I came back to uh, LA and we started the Coaches Association, which was the Association of Beach Volleyball Coaches. So I always had this passion to uh, build something in the sport and help the sport grow. Um, but it's very clicky, you know? Mm -hmm. And in the 80s, it wasn't very welcoming. And I'm from Kentucky. I'm a five for 10 black guy from Kentucky. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't my first, you know, experience on the beach wasn't very welcoming. So uh, to make this shorter, it went from me going through what I went through, my welcome to beach volleyball, meeting amazing people, amazing mentors, amazing opportunities, travel the world, worked with athletes from 16 different countries who represent their country. And um, yeah, got a bronze medal in 1996 at the first Olympics for beach volleyball, a gold medal in 2000 with the Australian women, Natalie Cook and Carrie Potthars. Uh, been the five Olympics, uh, four with Australia and one uh, 2016 was with Canada, was head coach mm -hmm. for the national program. And um, yeah, it's, it's really been this, uh, this journey. I've tried to start a pro league twice. Mm -hmm. So I've looked at okay. volleyball from all these different aspects. And um, I'm you know, work, working with the Vanuatu team now, which I've been on and off for about 11 years. And we actually did the, the Oceana Level 1 accreditation program, which was based out of Vanuatu for the Oceana region. And that was with an organization called OSEP. They do all the education in Oceana. Education for coaches? For beach volleyball, for coaches. For, so okay, this is yeah. the level one coaching course okay. for specifically for beach volleyball. Okay. And uh, there aren't many coaching courses specifically for beach volleyball. A lot of times you have the indoor course mm -hmm. and then they tag on some units for beach. But this is 100% beach. Okay. Um, yeah, so working with many countries, and, but in the background has always been business. And uh -huh. that's the thing that I've really uh, paid attention to. You have to be an entrepreneur to be a professional beach volleyball player yeah. uh, in a lot of countries. And, um, and let's say you have a 10, 15 year career as a professional, which is a good professional career. Yeah. Well, if you started 20, 21, now you're 35 years old, 36, and your career is over. Mm -hmm. So you have to have some other interest, some other uh, way to diversify your income and some other really higher purpose that you want to use this platform. When you do something, especially like professional sport, you, you create a platform for yourself. How are you going to use it? A platform in terms of people knowing who we are. And, and they, now they have an open ear. You have influence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can influence them well or not. You know? mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's unfortunate because professional athletes, some of them say, I don't want to be a, a role model or whatever. But that's part of the territory. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's in the public domain, anybody who has any sort of influence who people watch and want to emulate, you're a role model, whether you want to be or not. Mm -hmm. That's part of the job. So you might as well embrace it and uh, be uh, mindful and do it in a conscious way that something you care about. It doesn't matter what you care about. Mm -hmm. But just be conscious about it. And if you can monetize it, it's, it's really interesting because as a professional athlete especially, you get access to people in places that most people don't. Mm -hmm. 
and you have influence. So for a very short window, maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years, depending on your career, you have this, this window of influence and this access to people that most people don't have access to. Mm -hmm. And if you're business minded, you can flip that into your career post sport. Post, yeah, yeah. And well, even running alongside sport. Mm -hmm. And then it just segues straight into and, uh, your business. So that's the way I've always approached it. And that's the way I, I am with my athletes to get them to, you don't want your whole identity to be, I'm an athlete. Mm -hmm. And then it ends. And then you don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. And then you struggle with that. And lots of athletes do. They can't be anything but an athlete. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they think that's who they are. That's what you do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when I, so I, I did some quick homework. <laughs> <laughs> this was quick. Last this was night. Quick. Yeah, this <laughs> I mean, quick. I, normally I, I have some time to prepare for this interview, but yeah. not this one. Yeah. Uh, but there was something on your website which I very much. Um, liked and, and it's been the way I've been thinking also uh, that not only well do you have a way to do something after your sports you might actually or you're probably actually gonna do your sports better if you have this higher purpose and bigger vision oh, yeah that's it's all a part of so yeah. so it's not only a survival plan after your sports yeah. it's actually also a, a life hack for the sport <laughs> yeah so the way that I do um it, for me, it's, it's holistic high performance. Mm -hmm. And I learned it because I used to think that I represented all black people in the world when okay. I played. Okay. It was something I made up. Some kid asked me for my autograph and I was drunk. And, okay. uh, you know, it was my first uh, Manhattan Open, my first professional event. And we lost. We were horrible. But we were, we were athletic and my partner and I, we were both black guys. It was 19, I don't know. 88, something like that, 89, something like that, maybe 88, and uh, Ken Harris, and um, you know, I didn't take myself serious, I was a young guy, and came back to the event drunk, and this young, well, this woman came to me and said, my son would like your autograph, and I'm drunk, and I got a beer in my hand, and a McDonald's cup, and I'm like, what's going on here, who, who noticed that I was even here, and you know, so I tried to straighten up, gave the autograph, and uh, I asked the guy I was with, my buddy Milo, I was like, what happened, man? That, we were sucked yesterday, what's going on? <laughs> it's like, you're the only black guys in the tournament. Everybody saw uh, you here. Okay. And so I made up in my head, now I represent all black people when I play. And the pressure, and Dane Blanton understands this pressure because he's kind of lived this, this whole thing himself. He's handled it a lot better as a player, for sure. But this whole thing of, you know, people looking at you and, and then getting some bias or some thoughts about something. And we just see what you should be or what they think you are. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, like what I did, making up this story about, oh, I represent all black people. Now, no black person gave me permission to represent them. This was only me, <laughs> me making it up oh. myself, right? And so that was funny. And it took me about three, four years to really get over that. And it really, I was, it made me a horrible player. When I played in pro events, I wasn't very successful because I had all this pressure on my back okay. that, that I created. Nobody else told me. And um, when I finally got over that, and I was ready, to, I was about 27, and I was ready to, uh, to really excel as a player. I quit my sales job. I was in sales and marketing. And I, I was going to train full time. And um, a friend of mine who was playing on the women's pro tour asked me to coach her. And then someone else asked me to coach them, and I thought, huh, this can be a business, and I don't have to do sales, and I can be at the beach, and I can train full-time and play. Like combine coaching with, with your own training? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, coach, and then be at the beach, get my own training in, mm -hmm. you know, be, because before I never really took it seriously. I was an AVP member, I was an associate member, part-time. You have to play so many tournaments before you become a full member. I only played maybe three, four pro events a year, not many. And because uh, I, I didn't take myself seriously, mm -hmm. you know, I was always, I'm not going to be a beach bum. You know? <laughs> like, I got to work, man. I'm living in Marina Del Rey with my girl. I'm like, I'm waiting on tables. I didn't take myself seriously. I, I didn't invest. Uh -huh. So <laughs> when I finally decided to invest, by the end of the year, I had 13 clients and half of those were pro women athletes. Okay. And now I had a decision. Pro player, pro coach. And I chose coach because... 
my goal was to create a, a, a career and a business out of beach volleyball. Yeah. And yeah. I had this business, but I didn't have any time to, you know, to train. I'm like doing 12, you know, eight to, eight to 12 hours of coaching back to back every day. Okay. <laughs> With, you know, between the pro athletes and amateur clients and stuff, I had this successful coaching business. And um, it took me another about three or four years to get over not playing. Because I, I was playing and I'm at the top of my game, and, but now I'm coaching. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching guys I can beat, doing well on the AVP. And, uh, but it showed me something else. There's just more to it than playing. There's all the other, you gotta get a partner. Mm -hmm. Well, to get a partner, that takes some rapport, there's, there's things you have to do. You have to fund yourself. You have to have the time. There's so many things that you have to do that people don't think about when you're a pro athlete mm -hmm. than when it's your lifestyle. You just go down to the beach when you choose or play tournaments on the weekend. It becomes a way more bigger investment to be a professional player than just... Huge investment. It's yeah. excellence, right? Yeah. And you, know, you asked me the question, holistic high performance, what I discovered about the higher purpose was it relieved me of... Um, thinking this was about me. When I thought, oh, am I big enough for this? What makes me think I'm worthy of this? When I'm thinking about myself as an individual, these are the conversations, the internal conversations, mm -hmm. especially under pressure. Can I handle this? Am I big enough for this? You know, the whole, and the answer is no. No individual person is this big. But when you have a higher purpose or a worthy mission, it's nothing to do with you. You just show up and be who you can be for the purpose. Mm -hmm. And in, I didn't get those conversations of, am I worthy? Am I big enough? What makes me think I can do this? Had nothing to do with that. Had to do with commit to the purpose. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not me. And so that's where I think the higher purpose stuff really comes in and it helped us win a gold medal at the Olympics uh, in 2000. 96, it was about personal achievement. And when we got to the semifinals, we choked. I think we lost 15-3. Really good Brazilian team, uh, Monica and Adriana, but we had played them well, beaten them throughout the year. It was not a 15-3 game, but the pressure was too much. And uh, we recovered and got the bronze medal, but we knew there was something we needed to learn for 2000, because it was a home Olympics in Sydney, mm -hmm. and we had four years mm -hmm. to prepare for it, and we we had to, it had to be something different. And that's where we went on this, uh, this journey for what's the mental, emotional, psychological part of the sport that we're not getting. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Fuck, so many questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is all, because I, I, I know you 15, like the business, 15, right? Yeah, all, this to business, right? <laughs> all this transfers over to business, right? All this, because it's high, it's high performance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So exactly. All transfers, man. Uh, which way do I take this first? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. It's, it's been a long journey, so. <laughs> exactly, because a little bit ago, so we'll definitely talk more about this high performance stuff. A little bit ago, I was like, um, I had two questions in mind, kind of more surface level, uh, about your playing career, and also yeah. it sounds like you've been coaching mostly women. No, uh, no. Well, I when, was when known you started, as a women's coach. What did you say? I was known as a women's coach okay. because I coached on the women's pro tour, and then I coached the Australian women. But '97, so after after we '96, we got our bronze medal. The Association of Beach Volleyball Coaches. I was my company, we were executive directors of this nonprofit coaches association in LA. So I went back for that. And in 97, after the Olympics, they gave me a call and said, look, we're forming a formal program. Would you help us structure the program? I thought I was gonna be the head coach. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> but they needed an Australian guy to be the head coach. So they offered me this position as international coaching consultant. So it was a parallel position. Uh, he ran the program and I mentored the coaches and athletes. And um, yeah, so I went back to Australia and um, it's, it's what I do is like help develop programs. So I coached all the coaches and coached all the, all the athletes, helped them with their systems, um, male and female. And it's funny because Victor Amphiloff, who is one of the founders with the, um, the International Beach Volleyball Coaches Association was one of my athletes, him and Andrew Schott. Okay. So, and I was a guy, I play, I play men, you know what I mean? So it's interesting that people 
see me as a female coach. A lot of times people saw me as an Australian coach, even though I'm American. Yeah, yeah. And I started out five years on the pro tour in the States, helped found the Coaches Association that was oh. the coaching branch for the CBVA yeah, in the yeah. day. But I've just been 17 years in Australia, yeah. worked with a lot of, a lot of women. Um, yeah. The bias probably comes from what is, what does most people know? Like, uh, I only said women's coach because when you, in the beginning you listed up where you, what you've done, like I just hear women's team, women's team, women's team. <laughs> because of the Olympics, right? Exactly, exactly. So it was really interesting. So I was coaching uh, Rob Hyder, who ended up going to the Olympics for the USA, right? And um, he was playing on the AVP, and Rob was, he was a rookie. And we trained at the same beach, and he was playing. And so I was coaching him. And because I'd been on the women's pro tour, 90 to 95, mm -hmm. this was my segue into the AVP. Now, I'm playing against these guys, okay. and I'm training against them, so it wasn't cool. Nobody was like, yeah, you can coach me, because I'm a competitor, right? <laughs> yeah, And uh, <laughs> you can inject some false information into them. <laughs> well, I just think that there was, and, and it's very cliquish, right? And I was always kind of an outsider. I yeah. was um, on the fringe, and I think I set that up myself, because I didn't grow up in California, and um, there was a um, there was cliques. When I got there in in LA, it was 1986, I think, and there was beaches. Like I started out at the Santa Monica Pier, mm -hmm. and then I went to State Beach, which is down the road, Will Rogers State Beach. Well, that was Randy and Cindy Smith. Santa Monica, that was Randy and Cindy Smith. Well, in Marine Street, that was Mike Dodd and Tim Hovland. Okay, and if you trained at those beaches you were Marine Street or you were State Beach. And then there was the South Bay. And those were all the guys who were Primitive Print and, you know, uh, Agatubby and uh, Frohoff. Those were all those. So there were very specific beaches. And, you know, there were some other beaches off and then carts came in later. And if you were from that beach, it was territorial. It was like surfing. Okay. Because beach volleyball were basically surfers who came out of the water yeah, yeah, and yeah. came to the beach, right? Uh -huh. They brought that whole culture with them. Okay. And, uh, you know, there were kids who lived in that area. They grew up in that area. And even though it was a public beach, they felt like this was their territory. And you know how it is in surfing. If you go to a specific area, you're not a local, man. You yeah. might get, get yeah. bored, bro. <laughs> Anything could happen, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's the way it kind of felt when I first came to L.A. It felt like, oh, who are you? Where you come from? And... Uh, but then later, I met some people at the Santa Monica Pier who were very welcoming. And, um, and it, I realized, I'm like, okay, this is my sport now. And Santa Monica is my, my area. So started at the pier and then um, went down to State Beach. But the, but the whole territorial thing, I never really put myself in the cliques. Okay. You know, it was, uh, even as a coach, it's really interesting. I've worked with athletes from 16 different countries um, and I like the idea of helping to benefit the sport mm -hmm. in different places instead of just one allegiance um, and with that said I still have some unfinished business to do in the States I think so okay hopefully I get a chance to go back and uh, help help volleyball in the States beaches you know suffering a lot of places but yeah. suffering in the US and yeah. uh, love to see it uh, I'd love to see it get back to being that um, that place that people can look to, like Brazil, the mm -hmm. U.S., there's sp specific places where you go, you can, the information's there, the culture's there, and uh, I think that's a bit lost now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, so one thing I'm curious about, did you learn to play volleyball in Kentucky? or? Yeah. And you came to California with your skills, or no, man? I came to California. So <laughs> this is funny. My first game of volleyball, uh -huh. my my cousin took me to our local park, Chickasaw Park, okay, in Louisville, Kentucky, concrete court. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I've so this is fourteen years now, fifty six now. So it's 40, 42 years ago, and um, I'm like. Volleyball is a girl sport. I mean, who plays volleyball? I play basketball and football and baseball. It's Kentucky, you know. And um, and I show up. My cousin, who was a was a professional basketball player, he played in Europe and um, 
you know, uh, there were other, and he played with the Harlem, not the Harlem Globetrotters, he played with Metal Ark Lemon, he had the Bucketeers, he played that sort of pro basketball. And he had two friends, the Bunton brothers, 6'11 and 6'10. These are grown men, professional athletes, hitting the ball with their fist. And I'm like, this is not a girl sport. <laughs> Real quick, I woke up, I was like, wow, man, this is crazy. And, uh, but I loved it. And from there, we started to, you know, we played every like weekend, we play, and they were all adults, I was 14. The next youngest person might have been like 22 or 23 or 24, and, you know, all the way up to like 40s and 50s, you know, it was, it was an older group of people. But I, I could compete, it was technical, I couldn't just be athletic. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, this is challenging, man. So I really took to it. And then we started to go around town and play in different leagues around the city. You know, now you're getting called for mishandling the ball. So, yeah, that was my, that was my welcome to beach volleyball. And I um, played on two traveling teams. The Louisville Flyers was my main team. Uh, Jack Gallagher was a mentor of mine, and he had played volleyball in, in school. And so there's some skills. And then the Kentucky Flyers, I played with them a little bit. And that's where I saw, I saw guys who had real skill and technique and who had played at university. And I was like, oh, okay, there's a whole different world out here. And that's, that's what started the dream of going to California and maybe going to school. You know, I didn't know that I only had two years of eligibility. <laughs> okay. know? Nobody's going to, you know, a kid from Kentucky with two years, they want you to have five years, they redshirt you. Uh, but then I went to the beach and um, yeah. So I came out there, I couldn't, I didn't know though, because I played triple A ball in Kentucky, I'm playing in regionals, and I uh -huh. think I could play. Had never been to the beach, and so, had never seen the ocean. So it was just for my 21st birthday, and I went to Santa Monica Pier, and um, I didn't know the culture. And in Kentucky, somebody shows up, hey, come on over and play. You know, it's very welcoming. Uh, uh, no, not like that. No. <laughs> Start way down there, work your way up. But I didn't know it. And so I'd, I'd come the day before, and I watched the system. I just sit and watch. And I'm like, two people? One blocker? How do you, how's that getting blocked? I couldn't believe it. I'm like, indoors, you know, we're hitting the ball all crazy. And three blockers? I'm like, man, one blocker? These guys are horrible, man. Getting blocked. And uh, the next day I came back. And you used to have to sign up. It's public beach, you sign up. Mm -hmm. And you have to take all comers, right? So <laughs> I sign up and I'm sitting, I'm waiting, and it's been too long. And I see this group of three guys by the pole. And they're, I know they're up to something. So I come over and I see my name's been scratched out. Okay. <laughs> so I'm like, hey guys, uh, yeah, that's my name there. You know, my, I think my game's next. And they're like, oh, we thought you were another Steve, another Steve who's already played. I'm like, no, that's me. And they're like, okay, well, uh, you need a partner. And there's all these people sitting around like, no problem, man, somebody wants to play, are you kidding me? So I go walking around to everyone. No, bro, uh, I'm gonna wait. Oh, no, bro. I'm like, bro, what's this bro thing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and again, this is like 1986, right? Uh -huh. And, uh, and I, I walked around to everyone around the two courts, nobody wants to play. And now I think, okay, something's going on here that I don't, I don't know what's going on, but there's something. And I get to the last group of guys, and it's like three guys playing cards. And uh, I'm like, hey guys, uh, I got the next game. Would, you know, one of you guys wanna play? And this guy looked up at me, and I, you know, we became friends later, but at this time, we were not friends. <laughs> he looked up, and he goes, hey bro, the basketball courts are that away. And he's pointing to Venice Beach. He's like, ha 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 He just starts laughing. Now I'm about to lose it, man. I'm, something fishy's going on, I get to these, Basketball courts, hey, now I was wearing my Michael Jordan number 23 at the time, so okay. I'll take that. <laughs> but it was just, it was crazy. And as I'm getting angry with him and frustrated, this girl goes, hey, I'll play with you. And I saw her play earlier, and she was a really good player, and she was very attractive. So <laughs> totally distracted me from those guys. All right, screw you, I'll play. Now, her boyfriend is holding the court. And I don't know this, but this is the AAA court. Okay. <laughs> I've never played before. I've never been on the beach before. The first day I stepped in the sand was the day before. The first time I seen the ocean was the day before. I just arrived. And here I am at Santa Monica trying to play beach volleyball on the, the top court. And it's crazy. 
and her and her her <laughs> her it was her boyfriend. He's like, "You gonna play with this guy?" She's like, "Yeah, you guys are all being jerks." I'm like, "Okay, a human <laughs> being here, someone who's you know." And so we go to start warming up. She goes, "Now you can't play, right?" And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, I played AAA ball back in Kentucky, no problem." And <laughs> you know, I have no idea. And we start warming up. I can't hand set. My passing's okay, but hand set, I can't. Like, I have no concept of how to. Because back then, you had to set a dead ball. Mm -hmm. if, the, if, you, if it was any side turn, any back turn, if the wind rotated the ball one full turn, it was a double. Like, mm -hmm. Basically, Jackie Silva and Randy Stoklos were the only ones who really hand set back then. Nobody, everybody was bump setting. And, um, and now she starts to get nervous. Like, Okay, you can't really play <laughs> again. And I'm like, okay, well, let's warm up hitting. I know I can hit. I had a 42 inch standing vertical. I can hit. I can jump. I can hit. That's my thing. And so I said, you know, the ball, she hits it back to me. I dig it. I go to hit and I'm, I broad jump. Like, that was my thing. Yeah, yeah. I can't get out of the sand. <laughs> and I'm jumping and I'm hitting the ball into the tape. And now I'm starting to freak out a little bit because I'm like, oh my God. I, the one thing I know I can do, I can't do. Um. And uh, she's like, hey. And, and I'm looking at her, I'm like, wow, she's put herself on the line against her boyfriend, <laughs> you know, the people she knows, and I can't freaking play. And uh, <laughs> so she, uh, she's like, hey, look, you don't have to hit every ball. You can just place the ball. So I went up and placed the ball, and she's like, yeah, get your feet to the ball. And, okay, fine. So it was good. We started running off the court. We ended up losing 16-14. Okay. And That's people are coming good. and sitting around and you know the whole bit. But I made up my mind. I'm like, these people are jerks. Screw this place. Beach volleyball sucks. I don't need to play this. And, uh, and I went, I didn't play for a year. I went and played indoor. And there was this thing called the Power League. And it was all the top teams in LA played, including the University, San Diego State. They all I had teams in there. And so that's where I played. I played with Glenn Sato, who was Eric Sato's brother. Glenn was our setter. And, uh, but I had hurt my shoulder so, <laughs> uh, when I was in Kentucky. So I had to get to a point where I couldn't swing anymore. So I started swinging left hand. And so I played indoors hitting left hand. It got to a point where I couldn't use my right to jump anymore. So <laughs> okay. that was time to quit. And uh, it took me a year. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to go out like that. And I went back to Santa Monica. And I was just standing there. And in Santa Monica, there was this uh, place called Hot Dog on a Stick, where you get hot dogs on a stick mm -hmm. and a lemonade. Anybody who's there, I don't, I don't think it exists <laughs> anymore. But. And then there was the sidewalk, and then there was the beach. And so I'm like kind of halfway. I'm at the hot dog on a stick. I haven't stepped into the sand yet. I'm having all <laughs> these bad memories of, hey, bro, the basketball courts, you know, that away. And, uh, and I'm. I'm and then this woman walks up to me and she goes, hey, weren't you here last year playing? And I'm like, well, that was a year ago. Are you kidding me? And she goes, hey, Mark. And her name was Shirley and Mark and Shirley. And this is a guy that was here last year playing, you know, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and they welcomed me into the beach and that became my home beach. And I just met some of the warmest, most welcoming people uh, that I've known in beach volleyball right there in Santa Monica. And... Uh, yeah, Butch May and just a bunch of mentors. That's where I met Mark Barber and played with his brother, Brad Barber. And Mark Barber was Randy Stokos' first partner and then mm -hmm. he ended up coaching him. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was just uh, this turnaround from I'm never gonna do this again, these people suck, to really understanding and respecting the culture. And oh, dude, you're supposed to start way down there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Work your way up the beach. You have to earn this. Nobody just comes in and gets handed. Mm -hmm. You know, you work your way. So that that became my. I started to really understand the culture, and I really started to respect it. Some of the things I resented in the beginning, because I didn't really understand the culture and the history. Um, I started to really respect and um, use to benefit me, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of wisdom in the culture. Like now when I go, like here, you know, whenever I go to any foreign place, the first thing I do is try to understand the people and the culture, seeing the language and the food, the music, all that sort of stuff helps to show you who the people are.
Mm -hmm. And so instead of coming in and going, okay, I got all this stuff and this is the way it's gonna be, it's like, okay, well, first of all, what do we already have established? Mm -hmm. And what's the history? What's the customs? What's the culture? And how do I integrate into this um, to benefit? I'm here to benefit, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that whole situation really helped me uh, on my coaching journey, really helped me. I think that's a really good point. Like, um, it, there is a lot of value in, I've also like traveled around, around and played in different places. I've been yeah. to California and like got in the boot and yeah. <laughs> after a while made myself into some court and, yeah. and whatnot. And, uh, I actually have a, a YouTube video plan that I, or maybe a podcast, I don't know, okay. but, but sort of just um, one thing that I've been thinking about is the competitive versus the social uh, intent with mm. playing yeah. uh, because often, so there's different types of fun in the sport, yeah. whether you play it socially or competitively, yeah. and one person can enjoy both. But you shouldn't really mix groups, and you yeah. shouldn't. You should have respect for that because a lot of people come in with a social mindset in the beginning, and they get angry when when someone says like, "Hey, this is invite only," or you know, "You, you got to win to stay," or or whatever. Yeah. And they go, "Hey, this is not fair. Everyone doesn't get to play the same amount. Yeah. This is not fun." And yeah, it is not fun if if you have that social mindset. But then once you learn to play, then actually the competitiveness and really getting to grind against those top level people and like someone that really challenges you, that becomes the fun. So mm. therefore the system has to be competitive, otherwise you yeah. don't get what you're looking for. I agree. It's, uh, even the indoor volleyball, I find, this, I find this part fascinating. You'll take someone who's been uh, an indoor volleyball player, they've either gone to university or they play pro, whatever. Then they come to the beach and they lose all their professional habits. It's amazing, the mindset. Now they think they have to like their partner instead of it being a business arrangement. Uh, okay. So when you're on a pro team, basketball, football, even indoor volleyball, everybody doesn't like everybody. You still set them, you still, you, you're winning together, right? Everybody is doing their role. Um, if you get traded, that's a business transaction. But if your partner dumps you and they try to make a business transaction, it's like a broken marriage. You know, it's really, I find it fascinating that the difference between lifestyle and profession and how athletes have a hard time separating the two. And I guess there's just this perception, not as much maybe now, or maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm not embedded in the, you know, the community as much as I mm -hmm. used to be, so I don't know, but there's, it just fascinates me. Even someone who's played professional sport when they come to beach volleyball, something clicks and now it's like this lifestyle and you know, they pay for their own coaches, they pick their own partners. There's this thing that happens where it loses some of the professionalism, mm -hmm. which I think is a shame. But it's hard, it's hard to take something that you love, it was hard for any sport, something that you love, you're passionate about as a kid, whatever, and now you have to make money, you have to do media, you know, there's all these regulations, mm -hmm. uh, the doping, so people follow you around, you have to report, all the things that you have to do to be a professional that you don't even consider when you're an amateur. Yeah. Um, and, and then people lose the passion for it because they're like, oh, this is, it, the fun is gone. Mm -hmm. So it's a different type of fun. Competitive <clears throat> spirit, winning, losing, the preparation, that becomes the fun and the passion. And it is a lot of fun if you get into it. It's a lot of fun if that's who you are. But mm -hmm. if you want to just have a lifestyle and party and be carefree, then it's social. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's amazing. And that's most people who play beach volleyball. It's social. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it really makes it, for whatever reason, it makes it, maybe just because there's no clear pathway for people. When you basketball for example or volleyball when you go your high school team then your college team and in the u.s and canada we don't have professional leagues and we did we did a study while i was in canada and the athletes are four five years behind the rest of the world because they have pro teams and world you know and, and leagues and stuff right clubs so in asia south america europe you could be 16 years old playing on a pro club mm -hmm. to whereas in the states or Canada, you go through university. So you're 20, 21 before you come to beach. Seriously, you get your degree. 
And so that, that's, that's an interesting thing. But there's this thing of uh, you go from one thing to the other indoors, high school, college, uh, or high, what, club, pro, there's this progression and mm -hmm. you know the expectation. But when you go to beach, it's like, oh. <laughs> there, there's no, no clear path or rules no or path. anything. It's like being an entrepreneur, yeah, working yeah. from home. Yeah. And you know how when you go into the office, <laughs> you have all the structure, you have to yeah. be there, everybody else is. But when you work from home, I, I'm sure people with COVID right now, <laughs> yeah. your kid comes in. Like when I work from home, I find it very difficult because my family sees me. Oh, so I'm accessible now. They think mm -hmm. because they see me, they, they can, can just yeah. talk to you or whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like you're neglecting the family if you don't talk back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's, um, yeah, it's kind of like that. I find it like, you know, trying to work from home where it's like, you have to budget, you have to hire people, you know, you're a boss, you have a staff, mm -hmm. you don't do it on your own. You gotta organize your plane tickets and you gotta deal with the relationship between your partner, yeah, yeah. all this stuff. So that's why I say you have to be entrepreneurial to be a beach volleyball player. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. So. <clears throat> The, the benefit I see of really honing into and understanding that is, so I, I play beach ball at a level where sometimes I say no to people and sometimes people say no to me because I'm not high enough skill. Uh, and I think it's really important for your career to not take those things personally. Mm. Because the, the, the guys that say no to me one week, they might say next, yes to me next week yeah. and, and no to me the, the week after. Yeah. And, and that's just the reality. That's like what happens every time you're on the way forward because yeah. you end up in this like in between gray zone. Yeah. And then after, okay, maybe it takes three months for you to get to play with them three times. Yeah. But you get that free time exposure to that level of play, and all of a sudden now you can hang with them. Yeah, and and that's when you start getting the invite all the time. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> but if, me you, if, you, if you take that personally, you know, you you get angry, and then they're gonna yeah. be like, oh, this guy is just drama, and then they're not gonna call you again. Yeah, because you are drama. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> it's professional, and the the answer is yes or no. It's uh, that was me at Santa Monica going, oh, these people are horrible, they're unwelcoming. And yeah. it's like, well, go earn your way up here. If you want to play on this court go prove yourself on these courts and earn your way. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not social, it's not social. But there's a beautiful uh, social culture. There is, Yeah. Uh, which it's, I think should be, I think everyone should be involved in that yeah. too, like, because it's super nice and there's yeah. so many nice relationships to create. But, mm. but with the combined understanding that you can do social, but then you can also go into business mode and there's nothing personal about yeah. me hanging out with someone and then saying the next minute, hey, I'm going to go play these people and you're not welcome. <laughs> yeah, that's just what it is. It's a business. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, man. Yeah. I don't know if surfing is the same. Like, it just seems like some sports have such a um, tradition and um, they've been pro for so long. And maybe, you know, like, like an amateur surfer, does an amateur surfer think, oh, I can just go over there and surf with a pro surfer? Is that the way it works? I don't know, I don't surf. Or is it like, okay, the pros are over there training, working, uh -huh. so we're gonna be over here out of the way. I don't, I don't know how it yeah, is. Yeah, so, so I surf a little bit, so, so probably someone who surfs better is gonna be able to answer this better than me, but the way I see it is, first of all, there's different surf spots with different mm -hmm. uh, difficulty and danger. Okay. So you really shouldn't, for your own health's sake, go into more difficult surf than what you can handle. Okay. Uh, and th the more critical, the more dangerous the surface, the more important it is that everyone out in the water knows what they're doing mm -hmm. because it's not only the water that's the danger, it's also the other surfers. Mm -hmm. And if they fuck up, they're yeah. actually a literal like uh, physical danger for you. Right. Uh, so, so I think that's why surfing is very aggressive in a sense like like if you don't know what you're doing you're actually people are going to beat you up because you're actually beating them up otherwise yeah that uh, makes sense. That makes sense. So, so i think it's a combination of that and and also i think access to the waves so if there's too many people in the water well it's mm. the waves divided by how many surfers are out there yeah. so 
at a certain point where then when there's too many people out in the water you will not get waves because there's just too much chaos and too many yeah. people in the way and okay. and whatnot so i think it's a common mm, it's interesting that's the way i've analyzed surfing so far yeah. i'm a very intermediate surfer <laughs> but that makes a lot of sense you know like i said i don't know much about it but i observe and that's that's when you speak about that 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 looks like what i'm observing right yeah that's yeah it. but there's an understanding and it's part of that it's natural to the environment. With beach volleyball, this is one thing that really gets on my nerves, man. You'll see people, people who play socially, or I love watching people who play socially, who, just, who have no skill, because mm -hmm. they understand the true essence of the game. Keep the ball off the sand. Uh -huh. <laughs> Get it back to the other side of the net. And they come up with these creative, you know, sumo, roundabout, <laughs> whatever, whatever they have to do, kick it, whatever they have to do to, to achieve that mission. And once you start learning skill, if you don't do the skill perfectly, people quit, you know, they mess up, they, oh, they stop realizing, oh, the goal is to get that ball on the other side and get it down to their sand, keep it off your sand. Yeah. And these skills are just tools you use to achieve that. To make that happen, yeah. But don't forget the first part, you know? <laughs> and um, so when I see people play uh, volleyball and who don't really understand the game because they're just throwing the ball around. And this is why the indoor, when they did the overhead thing, it got on my nerves a bit, was because it's such a difficult game. Like to hand set a ball without a lift or a double is such a technical skill. To, you know, we're the racket, so to, it's a rebound sport. To pass the ball, to form the shape in the wind, in the sun, no substitutes, you know, to, to make those shapes and to control that ball on a very large court that's you know almost the same size, it used to be the same size as six people uh, yeah. on a hard surface, and now you're outdoors in the <clears> sand <throat> running around. So when I see people play and um, they don't understand the technique, like they're just slapping the ball around and they think that's actually the sport, no. When you play by the rules, to me that's like dribbling the basketball, and because someone's coming at you, you just pick it up and run with it to get mm -hmm. out of the way, and you start dribbling again. No, there's specific things you have to do in order to play it. So when people actually play the sport and they experience how difficult it is, then they have a respect. But a lot of people don't have respect for the sport because the social part of the sport, you just kind of slap the ball around and keep the ball up in yeah. the air, right? Yeah. Um, which is interesting because like table tennis or golf or, or nobody, when you learn to play those sports, you don't get to do that. You don't get to just... If you golf, you don't just get to pick up a ball and throw it because you can't putt. That's true, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. You don't get to do that, right? Or grab the ball, or hit it with two hands because you have to it's learn. It's more to do intuitive it. that you wouldn't do that. But the, but the beach volleyball rules are sort of a little bit hard to understand, so it's not as it's a tough sport. obvious from the beginning for people that you can't do that. It's a tough sport. And as, as a culture, we don't hold people to that standard. We allow... Even in development programs, they allow doubles and all this sort of stuff so people learn because the skills are so difficult. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the things that attracted me to it was I couldn't use my athleticism to just advance. It was so, it's like golf. It's a rebound sport. Table tennis, golf, you have to know the math. It doesn't matter if you're athletic and you can't control the ball. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was, that fascinated me. And so, and then when you bring both worlds together, you can bring your athleticism, your knowledge and strategy, together with the technical skills, together with the relationship. It's, uh, it becomes a very good mix in the head. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a really great environment to, uh, to see yourself. Yeah. Under pressure, in relationship, no escape. It's, um, yeah, that's, that's how I like to use it. And that's, that's, I had to do it naturally because remember I had the, I represent all black guys. <laughs> All black people think, right? <laughs> so I really had to go on my own personal journey of self-discovery to uh, how do I manage myself under pressure or how do I manage this relationship when they're not serving me, they're serving my partner. Uh -huh. So my destiny's in their hand. Yeah. And the natural thing to do is to get you feel vulnerable, get worried, be upset. But the champion thing to do is to be a leader and how can I help the team and how can I help to enhance their performance in my role? I mm -hmm. can't perform for them, but I have a role where I can help enhance their performance. Mm -hmm. And so focusing on that instead of, you know, the risk or the vulnerability or my fear of 
this person holds my destiny and they suck right now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It's, that sounds like a better environment for your partner to, to pass in if you're <laughs> <laughs> there to help rather than be afraid. And you uh, see it, right? It's people, they start blaming. I saw one player, this was their, their habit. Whenever the partner wasn't producing whatever, they would actually start like exaggerating. Oh, do you see that? Look how bad my partner is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that people around would think that it's that guy's fault. Yeah, it's yeah. totally relieved. And, and you know, I get it. It's the ego who can't take that, uh, <laughs> take, can't take the loss like that, right? So it's like, oh, look, it has nothing to do with me. This person's so bad. Why am I playing with them? They're so pitiful. You know, it's uh, like, yeah. who would play with this person? Yeah. You know, it's really funny. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, sort of, Weird corners of, of mentality in, in this. <laughs> you can see your true sport. self yeah. under pressure, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm uh, uh, super curious about this. You said you had this mentor that mm. shared a lot of stuff and, and said, share this to people. Yeah, <laughs> like, I had, I had, that, yeah. that's yeah. that's a good yeah. teaser for me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. Is yeah. there so so one of the questions I had written down here for you was was is there something that you often think is mistaught in the sport, like something that people mm. teach, and, and you, you're like, if I would be growing the skill level of the sport, I would probably wish that everyone taught it this way instead. I'll combine that question yeah. with sort of. Uh, did this guy? Yeah, there's not really in yes. <laughs> the, uh, so uh, my main coach was uh, Mark Barber. He just passed away, I think it was like three years ago. Um, and uh, there's some people, so volleyball is in different places in the world, and they're amazing people in different places. Um, Brazil, for example, you know. Jackie Silva used to tell me about her coach, and uh, I watched him train for 45 minutes. Um, this one move <clears throat> where uh, was, they weren't even on the volleyball court. They were off to the side of the volleyball court. I can't even remember where we were. It was her and Sandra Perez, and their coach was coaching them. And all they were doing, he was, the ball was going outside their body, and they would go outside, and they would just move the hip forward, and it would change the shoulder angle, which changed the platform and it would just protect the ball. So you see how people go to pass the ball and it just slides off them and goes off mm -hmm. to the side? They would be there and they would get there and they were just pushing the hip. Mm -hmm. And they did this for 40, I sat there for 45 minutes and watched this and I was like, that is genius, man. I mean, maybe it's a common thing people do. I hadn't seen it before and I didn't see anybody else teaching. So I know there's all these amazing people, the guy in Germany who's got a, you know, it's horrible, I can't remember his name right now. Um, got a gold medal with the men, gold medal with the women. Mm -hmm. What in the world is he doing? <laughs> yeah. Women and men, gold medal. I yeah. mean, that's, wow, that's pretty impressive, man. No, you know. So I don't think there's a right and a wrong way to do it. There's more effective ways to do it. Mm -hmm. And I like to look at beach volleyball like, like tennis in the sense that there's different surfaces, different conditions. So when you have hard court, no wind, uh, like, like literally harder sand, it's a jumper's beach. Mm -hmm. You can hit the ball from four meters off the net, you can get up and kill it, which you can't do in deep sand and wind. Mm -hmm. So that's more like clay. Yep. And then you'll have surfaces that are slow, so some surfaces, everybody's a better defender because they can move. Everybody's a better attacker, blockers are bigger. If you're shooting the ball, it's the wrong strategy. You don't sh try to drop shots on the hard court. That's just for, sand, or for, uh, for the clay, you know, and then you have grass. So there's all these different surfaces and conditions that I think change the game. And so depending on what environment you're in, there's a better style of play. Mm -hmm. Or maybe to do the technique a different way. In heavy wind, if you're passing outside your body, good luck. It's, it's first of all, your variation's too much. If you're on the left side of your body, you know, at 45 degrees on the right side of your body at 45 degrees, when you put that together, you have this huge passing radius, which the ball's going to be all over the place. And 
your error is going to be exaggerated by the wind. So keeping what I like between my knees, keeping the ball forward like a midline pass, mm -hmm. you can put your hands over to the side of your knee, but the, the arms operate like a midline okay. pass. It's forward. As soon as your hands get to the outside of your knee, your shoulders turn facing outside your body. Mm -hmm. That's a lateral pass, literally. Mm -hmm. And your hips want to turn. Mm -hmm. So if you can keep your fists inside your knees, your shoulders stay like facing the net, not quite parallel because you have one foot forward, but they stay forward. Mm -hmm. So there's just some things um, like uh, physiologically and mathematically that happen depending on the, the, what you allow your body to do. Mm -hmm. And with that math comes benefits and errors. When you lateral pass, you can track the ball better because you're looking from the side. You can see the apex. You can see, if you can see the apex, then you can imagine what the other mm -hmm. end of it looks like. When the ball is coming right at you, like when you midline pass, you can't tell depth as well. Mm -hmm. So there's just benefits and liabilities with everything you do. Yeah. You just have to match up the, the advantages with the risk. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, so if there's anything, I would say I would teach people how to, um, how to manage the risk and advantage. And for me, it's um, gay, a guy named um, Ray Dalio did the, developed uh, asymmetric risk and reward, uses it for finance, he created Bridgewater. Um, and, um, and I use it for volleyball. So the, the risk has to be, so in some cases has to be five to one. If, I'm, if it's less than that, if the advantage isn't five to one, I have the wrong play. Mm -hmm. If it's one to one against this caliber of team, I lose. Because it's not really one to one, it's more like four to one to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's one to one, but it's not. Because as soon as the momentum turns against me, they go on a run of points. And it's like compounding interest. And uh, so, so the asymmetric risk and reward is something that, that I factor in um, to my strategy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I know we talked about this a little bit. There's so many concepts from business um, that transfer over and, and vice versa because it's really just about, it's about um, high performance. It's mm -hmm. about excellence. It is about performance. And performance is performance. So if I'm trying to manage risk, the same way I manage risk in business, I need to be managing my risk on the volleyball court. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I would, that's what I would uh, emphasize is... Um, so choosing a way to play that in today's conditions is going to give you the most and risk the least. That's right. And another way for that asymmetric risk to reward ratio to work in my favor, and I have a whole system for this, so I'm not even going to it. Uh, yeah. Proprietary information. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so for example, if I do the play at 100%, then I'm gonna, hit, I'm gonna win this point, and it's what I call zero challenge. No one's even in the vicinity. So the blocker doesn't have an opportunity, the defender doesn't have an opportunity. Zero challenge. If I pick a zero challenge play, and I mess it up, because there's no one in the vicinity, I could probably execute that play at 65, 70%, and still score a kill. Mm -hmm. So even if my execution goes down, because the play is such a low risk play with high reward, because mm -hmm. like some, you know when someone runs a cross play and the defender runs over and stands on the line early. Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm hitting the ball down the line with power, that's a high risk, low opportunity play because someone's standing there. Mm -hmm. Or if I swing cross court hard into a cross court block, maybe I wipe them, maybe they don't execute the block well, but it's a high risk play because I'm hitting right into the play. Mm -hmm. But there are several plays where the blocker has no opportunity, the defender has no opportunity because look at all the court that's open. Mm -hmm. So how well do I have to execute that play? Not too well. That's right. Now over time, this starts to compound in my favor because if I pick a different play and I mess it up, they win the point. Mm -hmm. If I pick this play and I mess it up, I win the point. So not only does it show up in the scoring, 
but it shows up in my psychology, shows up in my mindset, in my emotions. If I'm losing points back to back, I feel a different way, I'm thinking different things, my relationship shows up different, they're looking at me crazy, whatever. If I'm winning points back to back, and it doesn't matter how, if I'm playing 65, 70% of my ability and I'm winning back to back points, is my partner mad at me? Or is my partner like, you're not playing so great, but you're getting the job done. <laughs> well, yeah. we're lucky. We're even celebrating and laughing about it, maybe. Uh, yeah. You know? But if it's going the other way, even if I'm executing technically at 80, 85, 90%, but I'm hitting into their defense, mm -hmm. how many times, have, you know, you, me, someone else, perfect technique right into the block on a hit? Oh, uh, oh. Uh. Feels great. Well, we just lost that point. And you even hear people say, oh, it feels so good. Maybe not at the highest level anymore, but I used to hear people have this amazing technique. It feels so great, and they get blocked. And they're like, oh, but it felt so good. You got blocked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All you had to do was chip that ball over the block. Nobody's standing there. Uh -huh. That's a way better play. You're going to feel a lot better. Right now, it's just ego. Mm -hmm. So I had to train my ego to get away from... Uh, how I feel, and more about the result. Yeah, yeah. It's not my favorite play. Maybe it's not one that I can execute the best, but it's one that they're most vulnerable with. So guess what my favorite play is now? The one that they can't defend. Mm -hmm. That's the play I have to use. Yeah. You see so many people struggle, and they just use the plays they like to use, and the ones that they're good at. And they'll beat most people until they come up against a team that matches up well against them, mm -hmm. and then they lose. Well, okay, you're out of the tournament now. No. If you just adapted your game to be, so I have strength versus weaknesses and advantage versus risk. If I'm matching my strength versus their weakness, over time, I'm going to have an advantage and more opportunities. If I've managed my risk so that it's asymmetric in my favor, that I could be performing at 65, 70% of my ability and still be getting kills, well now I have strength versus weakness and I have huge advantage versus risk. I'm making less errors, I'm getting more points regardless of how I perform. So, you know, people get stuck on the technique, the technical part of it and think, oh, I have to be the best technician. Yeah, the technique is the tool you use to execute strategy, but you win with strategy. Mm -hmm. You yep. win with strategy. And so it's actually what I say is, you win with strategy, uh, but uh, your skills are the tools you use to execute strategy. So they're interdependent. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, so people, don't, people get fixated on the physical part of the game, the technical part of the game, and they forget about the strategic and mental emotional part, mm -hmm. relationship, all the stuff that goes with uh, the intangible stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, there has to be both, both parts, uh, definitely. Yeah. You own a business, you're, you're a business owner, an entrepreneur, think about all the emotions and everything, I'm trying to make payroll. Yeah. Everybody else gets paid, maybe not you. <laughs> Miss payroll a couple of times and see what happens. Yeah. You know, it's a get sued. I got a buddy who owns a business in Canada right now, he's being sued. He's, he, hasn't, he doesn't think he's done anything wrong or whatever, but the person feels they're, they're suing him. What does that do to you mentally and emotionally when you're trying to run and operate your business? You have the legal costs, you have this distraction over here, mm -hmm. you win, you lose. I mean, it's, this is a business owner. Oh. So you have to accept that this is part of being in business, the price of doing business. And so you have to skill up in that area. Most mm -hmm. people just focus on the technical and physical and they don't skill up in the leadership, the owners, they don't skill up in the areas that support mm -hmm. the business. So yeah. they can just go do their job. Yeah. You know, there's a job and there's a business. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to have both. Yeah. Then I also do see people. Uh, I come into this with a bias from uh, from skateboarding and snowboarding, which okay. is a very uh, uh, execution-based sport. Okay. <laughs> there, yeah. There's no points given for for you know, and you can mm -hmm. try as many times as you, as you want, as long as you make it once on camera, right? Okay. Uh, it, it's good. Yeah. So so. I know that I'm, uh, at least in the short term, uh, 
worse off in beach volleyball because my mind, my my <laughs> the way I operate wants to do things uh, nice technically. Uh, but mm-hmm. but I also you actually in a video I watched that you yesterday you also mentioned this this uh, glass ceiling that you can hit into if you don't have the technique if you don't yeah. have the tools. Yeah. Because uh, I, I do see people that. Um, it seems for them like it's so much easier to work on the strategy and the, the partnership and what's not. Mm-hmm. So they sort of neglect the technical stuff and then they get to a pretty high level, but, yeah. but then they also like stagnate there. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. What do we call them? We call them underachievers. Uh-huh. I, think, I think the superstars and the underachievers start in the same place. They have extraordinary ability. And then as they, and this is, actually I have this uh, diagram, this triangle, and I think this is the way the sport develops, but it's also the way that I use, I, I do this to develop athletes. So I think it's nature of just the way you track if you become exceptional. Um, so it's natural to do it this way, but I think it's also the way that it happens. So um, because we're a rebound sport, we, technical is the foundation. Yeah. Um, in catch control sports, it's physical. Mm-hmm. So football, you give the ball to the big kid, runs all over the little kids. Yeah, yeah. The superstar, yeah. right? And then what happens to little kids? They become technical because they're not physical. And now they can level the playing field a little bit because they're technical. The big kid never learns to be technical. Mm-hmm. And then the little kids start to grow up. Now they're technical and physical, and this one's only physical. So they can do some things, phenomenal, but because they're not technical, they can't be consistent. Mm-hmm. And consistency is the thing that, that allows you to be at an elite level. It doesn't necessarily make you win at an elite level, but you can't even compete at an elite level if you're inconsistent. Mm-hmm. It's untrustworthy, you just can't do it. So it's all about technical skill. And so those are the two bottom levels, catch control, physical, technical, rebound, technical, physical. I think it benefits you to be technical, physical, regardless mm-hmm. of if it's rebound or catch control sport. But it's more natural for people when you can control the ball, control what it is you do, to use your physical first. If you're fast, you go fast. If you jump high, if you're strong, whatever, you, that's first. The problem is it sets, especially young kids up, it sets them up never to be students of the sport, to never master mm-hmm. it always lean on their ability and they because they have great ability they get away with some crazy plays maybe no one else can do mm-hmm. so it teases them to think I have this ability I'm, yeah. I'm great but they make so many errors they pick the wrong play it doesn't work so after the physical technical is strategic you got to know for me strategy always starts with psychology I have to know myself and I have to know my opponent how am I going to pick the right play I don't know anything about them. Mm -hmm. So I have to know who they are, how they think, what they do under pressure. It starts with psychology. And once I understand who they are, now I can identify their strengths and weaknesses, especially under pressure, because it's different. When they're not under pressure, they might be world beaters. But if I can create an environment where they feel pressure, they go into that fight, flight, or freeze response, Mm -hmm. now they're a whole different athlete. And you gotta keep track of both how they play under and with pressure. That's right, so you can recognize it, because uh-huh. they're not always gonna be under pressure. And that's, that's what, I think that's what um, fools a lot of athletes and, and coaches and everything else is, you'll have your team, they'll be winning, they'll be doing great, and then the wheels fall off, and they look like different people. Well, they are. And the reason is, is, is this uh, polyvagal theory. We think it's psychological, oh, something's going on in their mind, no. They're having a nervous system response, a fear response. They, they have a perception that their safety's at risk. Mm-hmm. And now they, because their safety's at risk, they go into the lizard brain. Mm-hmm. There's only about 5% blood flow going to the prefrontal cortex. They can't think. Mm-hmm. So whatever they could do before, they're not there. They're literally having a nervous system response, fight, run away, or freeze. You become a caveman. You become, that's it. <laughs> and here's what's crazy, right? As soon as the threat goes away, what happens? Blood flows, prefrontal cortex comes back online. Now they can think mm-hmm. and they can make rational decisions. And then they, they think 
oh, what's wrong with me, my mind, blah, blah, blah. It has nothing to do with that. You have to increase their perception of safety. Mm -hmm. If you never, and here's how it shows up. They're in difficult competitions. Everything's, but, but they don't feel threatened. They feel pressure. Mm -hmm. They might feel stress, but they don't feel like their safety's threatened. Then the big competition comes along. Oh my God, this is my once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, I won't belong anymore. Mm -hmm. People will have, now they're now it's safety. It's not stress and pressure. It's safety. I'm not gonna be. I'm not gonna make money. My life's gonna go to ruin. Safety. And as soon as they go to that space, now you watch them play. And this is the Olympics. Mm -hmm. We've done well at the Olympics because we prepare for this. We we create a, and the higher purpose is part of it. We create a a, a perception of safety. Because okay. you're working towards something bigger than what this competition is. Those are just some of the components. We do all these things to where, because we don't, I don't know where you feel unsafe. And you don't either. Mm -hmm. We have this internal uh, implicit bias. And most of the time, it, it comes from these wounds, these past events. We don't know how they got formed. We mm -hmm. just experience them. We can witness them. I'm acting in a way that I don't know where that comes from. Then we have this explicit bias of how we've created ourselves, education and experience and maturity and this is who I am. Now there's the implicit bias shows up under pressure and I don't act the way that I know myself to act. Now there's a conflict. And we see people have this conflict, they go into blaming and you mm -hmm. made me this and, because the ego can't take it. It's like this, this, this implicit hidden subconscious bias um, shows up and they're like, that's not me. Mm -hmm. I, I'm this other person. No, you're that. <laughs> you're both. But right now, because you feel threatened, yeah. you are your subconscious. Uh -huh. You know. That's interesting. I, I like that. Um, basically, so you worded safety. So uh, I read this, uh, I think I've talked about this before in the podcast. I read this book that suggested that there's um, that quick reactions, mm -hmm. uh, quick na brain signals in your brain yeah. need some dopamine in the brain yeah. for those signals to fire quickly. Mm. And for example, serve receive is about very much fine tuned in the absolute very last millisecond mm -hmm. of where you actually put your arms. So uh, if this theory is true, uh, basically, if you're not happy because dopamine is sort of a happiness, um, whatever, hormone or whatever yeah. it is, basically your signals in your brain that, that control your platform, they can't get there in time. That's interesting. So right? guess what happens? You're just a few milliseconds mm -hmm. off and you shank the ball rather than the ball going where it should go. That is interesting. So, I'm so, going to do some uh, research on that. That is interesting. If you find anything, send yeah. it my way. That uh, is interesting, yeah. So, so I always thought I need to keep myself happy. Mm. in service Eve. I need to not stress about things I need to because I can so service Eve used to be very much my biggest problem mm. and uh, I got a little bit better technically at it but the big sort of breakthrough and what can still make me a really bad passer today okay. is when I get scared or yeah. I, I guess now yeah. I say scared because you said safety yeah. so but before I would have said unhappy uh, or if I'm not stoked or, or not relaxed. Yeah. Uh, but I, I like the, I'm going to start thinking about that. Am I feeling safe or am I feeling threatened? Like, yeah. is, is there a... <laughs> That's interesting, man. That is really interesting. So the way, the way that I've always, uh, yeah, that is really, I'm going to have to study that, man. That's really interesting. <laughs> you got me on that one. Um, the way I look at it is resource allocation. Mm -hmm. So you only have so much resource, so mind space energy, um, you know, strength, whatever, time. You only have so much resource, focus. Mm -hmm. To make the, on this serve, in this condition, how much has to be dedicated to getting the technique right, movement, being an unconscious competent. Mm -hmm. uh, so you flow to the play because of the speed, the location, whatever. If you have some worry or some unhappiness in there, you have to dedicate some resources to that, whether it's thought, something goes to it, some attention, something mm -hmm. that takes away from 
from the past. So that's really interesting. Um, it's the same as you said before, you try yeah. to work from home and your family comes and knocks you on the shoulder. Yeah. Your resources, your time, your attention goes away and you can't focus away. on work. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> so, and that's, you know, again, just keep coming back to business because it's the same thing. It's resource allocation. You, if you have a finite amount of resources to expend right now, where do they go? Now, here's the thing that I see. Most people don't do that deliberately. We, we learn a technique and then we repeat it over and over again, but it's not done consciously. And so we might have some quirk in our platform, mm -hmm. but that's just my style. That's just who I am. It's how my body works. We, yeah, yeah. we explain it like that, right? Or um, I might have a habit that distracts me and doesn't allow me to really focus in on the play. Maybe I have some self-talk yeah. that distracts me or the best I can be is conscious, competent, you know, where it feels like a robot almost, where I have to think and think and it's just so much energy versus just watching the ball and I find myself like a magnet, just gravitating. So I like to look at, once we, once we get the technique, once we get the system, once we repeat it, then I really like to start to refine it. Okay, you're putting 60% of your focus here on your platform, how much needs to be in your feet. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you see people look down, all sort of stuff. You're putting 60% of your focus in your feet. That needs to be automated. Mm -hmm. Maybe only 10% of your focus needs to be in your feet because you should automate that. And if you're still having to concentrate about your feet, you're not seeing the ball mm -hmm. and you're not, you're, maybe your platform's in the wrong angle or whatever, or you're not thinking about targeting. So just really getting it down to your formula and then when you get that formula, now we repeat it and automate that. So it's not just the physical and the technical, it's what's my breathing? How's my physiology? What's my vision? Um, like, what am I, am I thinking? How do, we start looking at all that stuff and we put it all together and I think it enhances it. Mm -hmm. So I do oftentimes, um, I have to be able to do the skill with my eyes closed. Okay. So if it's passing, I'm moving, I'm moving, I get there, I should be able to close my eyes. The targeting's already done, I'm already facing. If I'm in a position where I still have work to do, that's an opportunity for something to go wrong. So by the time I get to the ball, and the ball's on me platform, whether it's hand setting, or whether it's um, passing or whatever, I should be able to close my eyes while I'm executing it, leave it closed through the execution, then open. The targeting's already done. Now it's just about the feel. It's the touch. Mm -hmm. And if I can't get the skill to perform at that level, then something's, I haven't, I haven't put something in place. That's interesting. My tracking's off, my targeting's off. Something's not, I'm leaving it too late. And then when the ball's on me, I still have work to do. Oh, now I gotta figure out where my target is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I track the ball with my platform facing my target. Then if I get caught out of time or whatever, I've already done the targeting. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening, so I know they can't see this while we're talking, yeah. but a lot of times people will, will track the ball, they'll, they'll follow the ball at their platform, but now my shoulders are flat, they're parallel to the ground. Mm -hmm. So the ball in my brain is like, oh yeah, I'm going to hook it back to, the, hits my platform and it flies off to the side. Mm -hmm. But if I'm tracking with my platform already facing my target, when the, now my inside shoulder's down mm -hmm. because I'm thinking... Part of my brain is thinking about the target. Mm -hmm. Then if I get caught, the ball's too high, the wind or whatever, it's still gonna go toward the target. Mm -hmm. Maybe the quality's down, but it's not gonna go flying yeah, the yeah. opposite direction. Yeah. So that's, um, I think for real high performance, like everything has to, a lot of things have to be automated and you shouldn't have to put a lot of resources into mm -hmm. it. And then something opens up. Once you get in the flow, like the zone, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, now creativity opens up. Mm -hmm. And most people never get to creativity because they're trying to execute skill. And they can do it at a high level. But once you get into creativity, is that thing that you see it, you get these cues you don't even know, you're doing things that, yeah, yeah. it's like you're not doing it. It's <laughs> just, you're in flow, you're like connected to the ball. And 
the ball does something, you do something. You're not even you're yeah, not thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. This is why I love like people have a lot of op opinions about peppering, but I love what I call ugly peppering, mm. just chaos. I'm, you're like throwing balls at each other in the face and the chest, yeah. whatever, and you just have to figure out, like you just let your body figure out exactly. several ways to figure it out. Yeah. And uh, it's just so fun when it does, because as you say, it doesn't feel like it's you doing it. Yeah. <laughs> you like the observer now. Exactly. It's like an out-of-body experience, right? And that's, that's where the conscious mind just sets you outside and goes, okay, we'll go ahead and do what you need to do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So would you actually practice with uh, shutting your eyes? Yeah. Just a few milliseconds before the ball comes to your platform? Yeah, or? just as it starts to go to the platform, close the eyes, execute the skill, then the ball is almost to the apex and then I open my eyes. Okay. Whether it's setting or passing. And I just did it uh, the day before yesterday or yesterday, whenever. I'm rusty, you know, getting old and yeah. everything. But I was doing some setting. And uh, the way that I have an approach system where one part of the body is facing where the ball is coming from and the other part of the body is open to the target. And so I always hold this shape. Uh, so I'm never, most people, they, they look at the source. So they point their feet, they point their shoulders, they face the source because that's where the ball is coming from. Yeah, yeah. Then the ball gets to them. Now they have to switch and figure out where the target is. Yeah. But I've got both things happening at once, so it, so it controls the shape of my body, not me. The source, have to be open to the source, so the ball can come into you know, my platform, and I also have to be open to the target, mm -hmm. um, so that when the ball comes in, it's just natural. You just turn a little bit in the end, and then you set it. It's closed, yeah. closed to the part that's already facing there. Makes sense. Because a lot of people are, are thinking about it like you should always face the target and then the ball sort of comes from all over your shoulder. But it's kind of, sometimes it's difficult to get yourself in place yeah. when that happens. And like I say, there's many ways to do a thing. Uh -huh, yeah. And um, my whole thing is about economy of scale, efficiency and performance. So I want to put the least amount of work in to get the most return. And, and I got this from, I think it was Apple, um, or somebody talked about a good machine. A good machine should, from the, the end user, the operator, should have the least amount of skill, the least amount of knowledge, and the least amount of ability, and still operate that machine at a high level. Mm -hmm. So with Apple, point click, point click. Mm -hmm. How much knowledge and skill do you have to have to point click? Not much. But you know, some other, you know, systems, you have to know codes and, you know, shortcuts and all this sort of stuff. Or, so, I, so that's the way I design my volleyball systems because you're under pressure. And I'm always expecting, whether it's mental, emotional pressure or whether it's physical pressure from time or conditions like wind or fatigue, over time, your abilities are going to degrade. Mm -hmm. So two things. One is I want to use less resource early and still get high performance and high results. So if I can be efficient and use less resources, I have more later. <clears throat> As my abilities start to degrade, it doesn't affect my performance because I only need 15 or 20% of my ability to perform at the level I need to perform. Mm -hmm. So if it goes down another 20% or whatever, I'm only 50% <laughs> of my, I can still, mm -hmm. Yeah. Within that 50, I can, I'm going to get the 20. So it's, again, it's like the asymmetric risk reward thing. It's like the thing I like about that theory is um, it's about winning. Losing is not really the option. It's either I'm going to win big or I'll win okay. Mm -hmm. So either way, I'm going to win. I'm just, you know, yeah, everybody wants to win big, but winning okay is okay too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's better than losing. Yeah. It's definitely better than losing big. You see people win big, lose big, because their system doesn't, uh, it's, it's not adaptable, it's not... Um, it's a little bit too much dependent on certain factors, and exactly. if they're not there, then they're fucked, basically. Exactly. Yeah. And beach volleyball, what factors can you depend on? You can't depend on the refereeing, you can't depend from year to year, you can't depend on the rules being the same. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes the rules change, the equipment, the ball, size of the court, all these things have changed. 
you know, used to be at the beach, now there are venues inside, you know, you, you can't, what can you depend on? What mm -hmm. you can depend on is maybe, maybe now the size of the court, there's antennas, the height of the net, the touch depends on the referee, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, so you have to be adaptable. Yeah. You have to have a system that's adaptable, and adaptable means it's going to perform at a high level, and it's going to perform as it starts to at lower levels. It's still it's going to perform. If it can't perform, then it's not adaptable. Like mm -hmm. you say, it's dependent on the conditions being this, so either it goes from this or failure. Mm -hmm. That's a horrible system. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, and it puts me sort of in the spot. And so. I don't know if I've thought a little bit about this. I'm basically trying myself to to get to the highest level I can. Mm -hmm. um, and I started somewhat late when I was 24. So what I found is that certain higher level players, like when I play with them, I can I can hang with them. I can win sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if I play with players of level below mm -hmm. so one one very practical example is if I play with players that don't um, for example uh, change their set height to me depending on how close I am to the net mm -hmm. so without me calling you know they just have this feeling like okay Alex is, is close now I'll just set him a little yeah. bit quicker if they don't have that feeling I can become a horrible player and I can play like kind of low level beach ball ball and still lose. Okay. So so it's like but yeah. but but in a sense it's also time efficiency because I don't necessarily need to train that skill to maybe start communicating this to the lower level players, maybe start adapting to that because as long as I'm playing this high level beach ball ball, everyone knows how to set and adapt the set height depending a little bit on the situation. So it's yeah, so interesting. Yeah. So it's it's always because I don't have all of the time in the world. So, so I don't have all the time to learn all the adaptability at lower levels, which I would also become a better player from. Mm. Uh, so I'm very torn there, like That's interesting. what's yeah. actually best use of my time. Yeah. I, mean, I, I totally understand uh, not investing time on something that's not going to return. Like, let's say it's costing you one point. And there's something else you can invest your time in, it's costing you six points. Yeah, yeah. Well, you invest in the six points. Um, I wouldn't say it's not costing you anything. I agree. I yeah. agree. Because shit also happens at higher levels. Yeah. Not everyone's always setting this, like they don't always have this awareness. And Yeah, but there's, a, but there's a reality in what you're saying that where do you invest your time and effort into growing your game? This is something I'm always looking at, where to invest the time and effort. Because this is where I find uh, people lose. They don't get better in the areas where they lose. They get better in the areas they're already winning. So they mm -hmm. might become better hitters or whatever it is that they like to do or what they already know how to do or where it's easy for them to grow, they'll get better. And, and a, uh, a team that can't take advantage of that, so they can't identify where their weaknesses are or they're just trying to outplay them, out-hustle them, out-skill them, and we're just banging heads against each other. No, you never let a team play from their strength. You identify their weakness. And then you build an environment where they're always having to deal with their weakness. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter how strong um, the strongest parts of their game are. They have to win with the weakest part. And this is where tactics and uh, wins over technique. Yeah. If, you, if you think like this and, yeah. and someone doesn't have perfect technique in absolutely everything. Yeah, it used to be pretty simple where you look, you, know, you saw people warm up, you go, oh, that person can't set. So you serve the part and you make them mm -hmm. set. Or that person can't pass, so you make them pass or whatever. That person can't hit. It was pretty simple. Now yeah, it's not so simple. <laughs> you know, it, it's still kind of the same, but it's not, it's not that simple, especially because the setting rules are uh, looser. And I'm not saying that they're worse, but the setting rules keep changing. So now you can double a little bit. Remember before, you could set a perfect ball and the wind turns it. It was, it was done. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's, I think this is, uh, there's this interesting thing where, um, yeah, I got stuck on the pass on that one. I was <laughs> just thinking about AVP because the AVP guys had a hard time when they first came to the F5AB tour. Because the hand setting was different. Well, 
or other things too. So here's the thing. If you give an average pass and you have to bump set, you have to be an exceptional bump setter yeah, yeah. and you have less control of the ball, yeah. which was what the AVP players were. They were all bump setters. On the FIVB tour, they loosened up the setting rules to encourage people to hand set. So now I'm giving an average pass, but I fix it with the set mm -hmm. and the set's not called. Yeah. So it was driving the AVP players crazy. until It gives an unfair advantage. Yeah. But then what ended up happening was FIB players became exceptional setters. So what they intended to do was to encourage hand setting. And, you know, one year they made the double illegal. The next year they made lifts illegal. They kept refining it, refining it until now you have exceptional hand setters on the FIVB. It's not, uh, and the AVP players had to adapt. They had to start hand setting the ball mm -hmm. and stop complaining. You know, it was like, <laughs> yeah. And then people would say, oh, that's a lift. And, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was really kind of an interesting thing. Ask me the question again, because I, I had a specific answer and I went off on this tangent. But uh, what were you, do you remember your specific question? I look, I'm, I'm off. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so about my playing career. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, yeah, so, yeah. So I'm torn sometimes on mm -hmm. where to spend my energy in my career yeah. because Sometimes I see value in like learning to play with maybe lower level players and adapting to that and overcoming those obstacles. But also I see that I can just play with better players and that's a problem I will pretty much never have and then I can work on higher level problems. Yeah, and that's, that is a reality. But the other part of that reality, I like to work in paradox a lot. Most people don't like paradox. They want it to be black and white, you know, it's either this or it's that. But sometimes it's both. It is. And especially in life and in this, it's both a lot, <laughs> which is funny. But uh, so here's the way I look at it. Let's, uh, let's say what you're saying is true. There's a ceiling on that. What's the ceiling? The ceiling is you have to play with athletes who compliment you. Mm -hmm. So how many of those are there? Mm -hmm. okay. Let's say there's X number of those. Then there's all these other ones that you can't play with mm -hmm. because they don't compliment you. Not a problem, play with the ones that you can, they compliment you. Until, but how many of those are negotiating with each other and other people, right? So now the numbers just start to, now your performance, let's say you had a bad run of performance, now some of those players don't wanna play with you because <laughs> they have other, so it just, it just makes it vulnerable, right? It does, it does. The flip side is, yeah, it makes it vulnerable, but it doesn't make it untrue. It's still true, you play with people that compliment you, and that situation doesn't come up enough for you to lose. It's not something to work on. So it's true and true. Mm -hmm. So it just, it just makes you vulnerable, that's all, to mm -hmm. certain situations. You go through your whole career and you're able to get the partners you want. That's never a conversation. Yeah. It's a fit strategy. So okay, yeah. it's, just, it's just risky. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the flip side of it to me is, and this is the way I like to be as a player, and, and I, I'd like to think that I was, I was this type of player. Uh, from a physical ability, from an ability standpoint. If, if you can't set, well, I have a technique where I get to the ball. I get the ball on time. doesn't matter if you set it high, low, inside, outside. I have this efficient footwork that gets me to the ball. I have this way of jumping, not only gets me to the ball, but with a little bit of effort, gets me close to, if not my max jump, every time, with very little effort. Very explosive way of jumping. It, I have very low contact time with my feet on the sand. I'm able to transfer my energy very quickly and efficiently. So with what doesn't feel like a lot of effort, I'm, I'm close to max jump, if not max jump. Um, and I get to wait a long time because the footwork on the approach is very dynamic. So I don't have to leave early or time it or whatever. I can be late, catch up to the play. So all these, so that's the way I developed the footwork. So now I'm adaptable. Mm -hmm. So now I can literally wait longer than someone else maybe even and catch up to the play. And because I do it that way, I'm carrying all this speed into the approach and then I transfer it up. Now it, it takes me less effort to get up out of the sand because there's a little timing difference and it's, it's dynamic, the blocker has to wait. They're not getting information. They don't see my approach. They mm -hmm. don't know which spot I'm going to. 
So now they're under pressure because, because I'm more dynamic. They don't have as much information. And so it, it benefits me in all these different ways. But what it really lets me do is gets rid of that problem that we're talking about of me being dependent on my setter. Mm -hmm. I don't care how you set, I want to be an effective hitter. Mm -hmm. So that's an attitude yeah. that, that gets translated into this technique that shows up in performance. Here's where it really benefits. So now I can play with the guy who's the perfect setter, I can play with the guy who's the poor setter. Mm -hmm. So the guy who's the poor setter might be the blocker I need, but he yeah. can't set. And now he can't play with all these other people. And it, I thought it was really interesting, Tim Hovland and Mike Dodd, um, you know, one of the best uh, American teams of all time, um, you know, Mike Dodd's a really interesting character for me. I saw him play a bit, and, um, you know, I thought, yeah, he's good, he's good, but is he really that great? That was my <laughs> arrogance and uh, ignorance. And uh, he used to side out and, and hit balls off the net, and I really didn't pay attention to that. And then uh, Hovland and Dodd broke up, and Tim Hovland played with Brian Lewis who was another really great player, dynamic player, great attacker. But Tim Hovland used to bump set these kind of low off the net balls that who can hit that? Mm -hmm. Tim Hovland can hit it. So for him, it's not a problem. Apparently Mike Dodd could hit it, but Brian Lewis couldn't hit it. Mm -hmm. And it made me really appreciate what Mike Dodd was doing. Like he was hitting some difficult balls, delivering on some really difficult balls sometimes. Not like they were really bad sets, but they weren't the nice sitting up there. No. They were like, they were a specific type of set um, that wasn't the easiest ball to hit. And that guy used to hit those balls and, and deliver. And so because he delivered, it, I never really paid attention to the quality of the set. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting. But to see Brian Lewis uh, play with Tim Hovland, and I don't know that Tim Hovland was that successful with other, other players. Tim Hovland was an athlete. He was like a, you know, a basketball player, and like he was an athlete. And, uh, but from a setting standpoint, you know, I found those sets to be a little low and off the net. And it was very difficult to find angles on. Mm -hmm. you know? So that was, that was interesting. Um, so being adaptable, like Mike Dockett went with Tim Holland because he was adaptable. Mm -hmm. Then he played with Mike Whitmarsh, who was an excellent setter. And not only was he able to win, but he was able to win late into his career. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would he still be able to win that late into his career, trying to hit the, that lower off the net bump set from Hovland? That's a good question. It's a good question, right? But then you really get to see his uh, abilities when he was playing with Whitmarsh. Mm -hmm. The level of comp his level of competition went up even. It was really interesting. It was really interesting. And I found this interesting too. Uh, there were so many good defensive players that played when Mike Dodd played. And he was in his, his youngest and his best. You know, you had uh, uh, Gary Hooper and, and Steve Obradovich and... Uh, like some of these older guys who were like great defensive players, you know, then you had your Brian Lewis and Adam, you know, Johnson, all this kind of, all these kind of guys. And Mike Dodd didn't win the best defender when he was like in his heyday. Then he's older and all these younger guys come and they learn how to, they start playing defense from the middle of the court. Remember Hovlin and Dodd, he played on a nine meter court. Mm -hmm. When he played on a nine meter court, he wasn't voted the best defender. He was one of the best, but he wasn't voted the best. I don't remember him winning it. But the guys who learned to play on the eight meter court and learned to play out of the middle, now he's winning the best defender. Okay. Really interesting. Again, it's hard to notice how good of a defender he was because his peer group was like superior. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then you put him against younger, fitter, stronger guys in his 40s or whatever, later in his career, late 30s, 40s, now he's the best defender. <sighs> because remember, he learned on this nine meter career, he's got the footwork, he's got the tracking, mm -hmm. he played with no block, he knows all these things, right? He played with no antennas where 
you could be this far outside the court and oh, hit yeah. the ball, you know, reading on the track. And there's something, I don't know what it is because I don't know Mark very well, but, you know, we know each other passing. But there was something that, uh, that he learned from that earlier generation that later made him better than all the younger, younger guys yeah. who were playing. It's almost like lost knowledge, or right? some lost knowledge there, right? Yeah, that's one of the things that keeps me going as a coach, and I'm so grateful for. Um, again, learning the history and uh, being exposed to some of this sacred knowledge, man. Uh-huh. That you know, you just you're not gonna read it anywhere. Yeah, you know, it's just literally older guys going, "Come here and play with me," and you know, yelling at you for an hour while you're playing, and you. If you couldn't take it, they wouldn't play with you again. But if you could, you know, you were on their beach, they wanted to see you grow, they would groom you. Nobody wrote that down. No. It's just knowledge, man. It's just knowledge. Exactly. And so, yeah, that's the, that's the interesting thing, I think, is uh, as the game keeps changing and evolving, now you have the let serve and, you know, the antennas, uh, the smaller court, uh, tournaments off beach uh, where the wind conditions and things are different. Uh, you know, international tournaments where you're not traveling domestically. Now you have to, different cultures, different food, different language, stuff you got to deal with before you get on the court. You know, it's a, uh, yeah, it's tricking you adapt, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I find it fascinating. Do you happen to know Mika Hunkin? Yeah. You do? Yeah. So so this guy, uh, I used to post my, or I still do, post my beach volleyball videos yeah. and tutorials on, on this Facebook group. And he used to comment. And um, then he said that he has a lot of this old school knowledge yeah. in his head. Yeah. Uh, that is basically <laughs> basically going to get lost if, if he doesn't get it out anywhere. Yeah. He was coached by Mark Barber. Okay. We trained in the same group. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so I, I've actually already recorded one episode with him for the podcast mm-hmm. where he wanted to, because he 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 was just like frustrated that once he's gone, like this yeah. <laughs> information is gonna be gone. Yeah. So so I was like, well, I'm open to just sit down and talk about it and and let's get it out there and people can learn from it. We're gonna re-record the episode because it ended up kind of bad, so we haven't done that re-recording yeah. yet, and it yeah. hasn't been released yet. Uh, yeah. But. Uh, yeah, it yeah. just made me think about that. He one. was a physical stud. He jumped so high and was a strong guy. He was a physical stud when he played. Uh-huh. When, we were, when we were young and beautiful, for my <laughs> Jose, he used to say, when I was young and beautiful, the things that I could do. <laughs> you know, it's funny. But uh, it's for my indoor team. But uh, yeah, man, that was, uh, he, was, he was a stud. There were a lot of, there were a lot of guys who were, were like really physical and stuff and uh yeah but the psychological emotional piece the strategic piece it's uh, a lot of that stuff that's where a lot of the lost knowledge is i think okay yeah uh-huh. that's where a lot of the lost knowledge is yeah interesting yeah it's um i think the whole I don't really want to go into this, but I think the whole like how the world operates with technology and like we're learning from YouTube videos and whatnot, like yeah. there's there's good things about it, but there's also bad things about it because yeah. the word to mouth sort of yeah. thing maybe disappears a little bit more. And I don't know, it's just like there's a weird shift. We just operate in a different way and yeah. it has both advantages and, and disadvantages. I think there's a there's a hybrid model where you get the advantages for both from both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I said this to the Canadian athletes when I was there um, in Canada, coaching the. Um, and, and this is for young people in general. I, I said it to a few different groups of young people. Uh, might be public speaking. I said it to a few different groups. The um, I really appreciate the fact that young people don't take crap. I find it fascinating. This goes with technology as well, but there's so many op- young people have so many opportunities. This blows me away. Um, if I stay at a company too long, it looks bad on my resume. So even though 
I have a pathway and I'm getting paid what I want. I start shopping myself around for another company. You know, like this, it's just so many opportunities. And, uh, <laughs> or, you know, the environment's not good. You're not treating me well or whatever. So I'm just going to leave, mm-hmm. you know? Whereas my generation and before, I'm 56, but before my generation especially, it was like, this is your opportunity. This is your pathway. You blow this. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. That was it, kid. You, you had that chance. You had that good job. And you, and, and, you know, you'd get the golden handshake. That was the thing. And you, uh, you buy your house and you put your kid through school. That was the American dream. It was this, you know, you, you stay at this job and you take care of your family and you buy your house. You put your kid through school. And, and, uh, and that's, the, that's the best you can do. And then they become better than you. And uh, so, but you take a lot of crap. Mm-hmm. You couldn't lose that job. No. Your boss is a jerk or whatever. So what? You make it work. So I think that generation and I, I having some of this, you got lemons, you made lemonade. Mm-hmm. I think that's what's lost. Mm-hmm. Kids like, I don't like lemonade. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I don't want lemons. It's yeah. like, so to be able to take that adaptability and um, that grit and resilience and combine it with a high standard and um, as aspiring to a good quality of life. And I think if you can combine the two, and I think technology is kind of the same way. It's you know, having the human relationships and uh, that oral tr- you know, tradition and knowledge and being, there's something when you're with people and you're doing something together that you can't get virtually. Exactly, absolutely. And you I think people that. are learning this more and more with this virus and lockdowns. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> yeah. But yeah. yeah, but but then there's also huge benefits to internet and books. Like yeah. it's it's just knowledge, you know, widespread. Oh, uh, you can't remember some of this stuff. Like you can get the stuff you can get an MBA course online now. You can mm-hmm. find it. Used to be, you had to be in an MBA course. Which who gets into an MBA course? Not everybody, buddy. Or you had to go to a library, and then certain libraries only had certain knowledge and certain industries only certain people had that knowledge and if you didn't if you couldn't access those people mm-hmm. or those organizations you couldn't access that knowledge yep. now that knowledge is just it's not knowledge any, anymore like information knowledge is it's like speed like how and transfer how can i take that knowledge and put it into practice mm-hmm. um you know there's also some skills of like weeding out what is good knowledge and what is not because there's mm-hmm. abundance of it and like where yeah. to find it and sort of uh, there's a whole set of new problems, <laughs> yeah. or maybe they're not new problems. Well, but they're exaggerated for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the whole analysis, paralysis by analysis, like it's too much thinking, too much knowledge. It's a, uh, I know you don't want to talk about this, but here's, here's an interesting thing, <laughs> I think, kind of this, the, uh, so I'm talking to my sports psychologist, and I'm complaining. Oh, these kids, these millennials, these kids these days, right, these millennials. And uh, we're in Canada. And she's like, Steve, you're responsible for them. We are. And I'm like, what? I wasn't even here. I was in Australia. I wasn't here in Canada. She's like, our generation have treated their generation in a certain way to where globally, this is how this generation is. You know? So even though you were in Australia, you contributed to this generation being the way that they are. And the generation before us did the same, you know? So like the hippies, you had the really conservative parents and everything. What are they, free love, they went to the hippies. Then all those hippies, what do they do? They gotta go put the tie on and go to, go to work. And mm-hmm. after all that free love and smoking weed, now they gotta be the, the people at work, right? And so they raised this generation of people where they don't wanna raise them like they were raised and their parents. And so now they have no boundaries. And, the kids have no boundaries. They don't have any rules. They don't have any, ex- there's nothing there. So, and, it, and then now these are the kids of those kids. And so it's really interesting, I think, how uh, globally we're responsible for each other. Yeah. You know? I mean, if you see something common here and there and there, and it's, you know, through culture and language and, and geography, and it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's, so there's like a generation to generation and 
maybe some people have probably tried to understand like what's coming next, what's coming next. And then there's a lot of uh, parts that we don't know about that might influence that also. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of hard to predict, but I guess it's possible to try at least. I got a 12 year old man, I'm 56, I'm 44 years older than him. I have no idea what his future looks like. No. I have no idea what my future looks like. You know what I mean? <laughs> no I, idea. I said 10 years ago that the next 50 years is going to be, if we survive, it's going to be the most interesting fucking yeah. thing ever yeah. to go through. And so far I've been right. Yeah. It's Change been, is so rapid. Yeah, yeah. Change used to be the way slower, right? Yeah. Like, you just, we didn't have the information, we didn't have the connectivity, so... Change took some time, but now it's like change, 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 change. Oh, it's crazy. Can't keep up with it, man. <laughs> it's the same thing in sport. Yeah. Like it's change, 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 change. I mean, now, what's going to happen to sport now? Venues, who's going to go back into a venue? Like, you know, you might get 10,000, 20,000 into a 60,000 seat venue, but what happens to all the venues and the sports teams and the salaries? And I think gambling is going to take a going to be part of the future online gambling I think it's going to become uh, way more prevalent and um, influential in sport because you got to make money somewhere it's not going to be in venues merchandising all that sort of stuff so where's the money going to come from uh -huh. look at poker darts look at all these sports uh, you know where so you mean the pro athletes are basically financed by the fact that people are gambling on who's going to win? I think the organizations are going to have some sort of affiliation with gambling and I don't know, man. That's interesting. It's interesting because right now it's a conflict of interest, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of revenue to be made and, uh, and online and I don't know. Where, where do you go? Because right now we have virtual audiences and stuff, right? But yeah. Okay, in five years' time, what's going to happen? Oh, fuck. <laughs> no one really knows. Remember that movie, uh, Ready Player One? No. Super, oh, my God. Ready Player One. There's a... That should be on my list of movies to watch. Yeah, because it's, it's, you know, it's a futuristic gamer movie. Mm -hmm. But the guy is... Um, so, everybody is in poverty. <laughs> Most people are in poverty. So they're in these shanty towns and they live a virtual world. So they literally have these suits that are sensory suits, gloves. And so they're, they're playing these virtual games. They spend their whole days playing these virtual games to escape their poverty. Okay. And um, <laughs> the corporations are feeding this addiction to games and stuff. Because yeah. you got to get equipment, you got to get tokens, all this sort of stuff. And so that's really interesting when you think there are people who prefer virtual life. Yeah. And what happens when it becomes sensory? Like when you can visually, when your brain goes, oh, I'm seeing what I'm seeing. And once you're, can, you can feel. Yeah. You, you start getting, yeah. what happens when they start doing like injections, you get a dopamine hit, like for real. Like you do something, and then whoop, dopamine. Yeah. Whoop, serotonin. Whoop, adrenaline. Whoop. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah, like, yeah. wow, man, it's gonna be, it's crazy. I mean, that's not too far off in our future. I don't know if it would, I mean, to legalize where, can you imagine if you had a suit and it had chemicals in it, and when you did specific things, you literally got a hit of synthetic yeah, yeah. dopamine. Yeah. That's uh, it's interesting. Like this conversation comes up in more and more places in my life, and it's mm. it's becoming more and more real with with everything. And, and uh, you can go so far down conspiracy theories route. Mm. You can go down politics. You can go all places. I don't really yeah, <laughs> want to go in a big twelve. Come back, come back. <laughs> yeah, uh, but but yeah, one thing that I. I'll go down a little bit because I do think it has relevance to, to both uh, playing sports and, and being happy in life is um, just uh, there's something called like technology detox like going for example for a weekend without your phone okay. and because we're 
so there's ways to handle your phone to shut off notifications and whatnot, but like most people don't have that. So so they they constantly have this beeping thing in their yeah. pocket that creates. It's kind of like the the kid that comes and hey, dad is home. I can touch his shoulder. Like yeah. I can get, grab his attention because he's he's not at work. Yeah. He's working from home. Uh, but that just constantly like doesn't let us into flow in life. Doesn't let us into long interrupted times where we can really dive deep into what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Yeah, one one thing where it hit me. Ah, okay, I'll go into this. I don't really want to. Uh, I gotta make sure. Uh, uh, and yeah, okay. I was gonna park my car in Sweden last year, okay. and it wasn't possible for me to park my car without having my phone. So there was wow. no pay to par- pay. There was no way for me to pay with cash or credit card. So I have to have this phone with me. That the phone has a battery that has to be charged for it to work. Wow. What's the difference between now I'm a hybrid robot, Robot. if I can't do some very basic things in, in society without having this charged phone with me. I can't go on a technology detox, whatnot and whatnot. Wow. And people have all these arguments about you're driving a car, like this is all the technology. Sure, uh, but we, maybe we have to think about what's gonna be next, 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 next after this. And, uh, yeah. And uh, I don't, because I'm pretty sure there's actual studies that say, yeah, we, we do get unhappier, we get more stressed by having this beeping th- thing with, a, with us all the time. I think we need time. We're human beings. We're, we're some flesh animals that have been on this planet for a long time without technology. And mm-hmm. we operate very naturally and happily without these things when we go into play we do either social things or we play beach volleyball or some other sport or whatever we have this time where we're actually physically interacting with each other (laughs) and not interacting with this cloud of information that is the internet and uh, i think sports is is um, a very it's it's almost like especially if we're going to a world where we don't need to have this, maybe we get machines that do the physical work. I, I used to work as a carpenter, so I know, mm-hmm. like, there's, there's a sense of non-technology in that too, mm-hmm. uh, and a sense of physicality, which can also bring you back on, to earth in a sense, the same way as sports. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when we don't have those jobs, I think sport is going to be one of the anchors that's going to remind us of, of our human actual, yeah. the way we are. That's really interesting. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. But yeah, I'll, I'll leave you that, that because uh, yeah. you can go into very dark and futuristic yeah. and uh, pessimistic and optimistic places and uh, nobody knows what's going to fucking yeah, gonna happen. So. Know. That's very <laughs> interesting. That's a good thought to, to bring. Thank uh, you. But like the, the, um, I noticed so I've been in Oslo uh, and there's a lot of kids. Yeah, they play a lot of computer games and maybe they don't get the sports maybe they don't play the soccer on the street or the basketball and the, you know, they go and play computer games or something instead and they sort of get into this very stuck in this virtual world where it could very much lead into this shanty town. Everyone's hooked up on, <laughs> on things. <Man. laughs> but then, then also at the same time, there's another guy that I interviewed for the podcast. He's, uh, maybe you know him, uh, Swedish Olympian 96, uh, Tom Englen. Uh, I think so, but I have to. Um, uh, so he, he nowadays works with um, uh, something called physical literacy, which is coming from Canada, yeah. uh, which is basically science on how to get kids more physically uh, in touch with their body and yeah. movement patterns and whatnot, which leads to, so the research shows in, in the long run it leads to better confidence in sports for the kids which better confidence and performance which makes them enjoy it more yeah. which then leads them to do it more which then leads to a healthier life yeah. uh, so so there's like this it's like these two worlds are like working at the same time and like pulling there's a paradox man there you go. <laughs> but what you said though interesting that the role that sport could play in the future to uh yeah to give people that physical social experience that's uh, that's interesting yeah, yeah that's i know i feel very alive when i do sports when i do dancing when i do certain physical things yeah. which i can also get from uh, 
certain type of work that is not online work. Mm. Uh, but of course, it's even more fun to go play volleyball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, enough about the the world. That will be for some other podcast or two yeah. <laughs> to cover. I think uh, I only have a meeting here in 20 minutes, or did I miss my meeting? I don't know. Oh, shit. Oh, you have an end time? Not, oh. not here. Um, I have a meeting in Canada. Uh, it's either 9.15 or 10.15. I don't know if we changed the time or not, but... Uh, yeah, Do we want to pause for a second and check it up? Uh, yes. Give me, give me yeah. one second. Here. And I can let the recording record and I just cut it out afterwards. Okay, that's funny. They missed a meeting. Sorry about the missed meeting. I got hung up on something this morning. <laughs> we both missed a meeting. <laughs> that's pretty funny. That's synergy right there. Boy. That's sync, synchronicity. Wow, that's really interesting. That's really, this guy, he doesn't miss meetings like that. So that's really interesting that uh, I look at synchronicity and, and different things, and uh, the fact that we both just missed this meeting. That's like crazy. He missed the meeting. Yeah, and so we're here doing this. Oh, that's pretty crazy. That is crazy. <laughs> I don't so take that those means things that, like, I, that I can ask you a couple more questions. Yeah, well, now yeah, I'm one. good. <laughs> we're good. I'm good. Awesome. Perfect. Uh, yeah, I think synchronicity, it's, that's a word that probably a lot of people don't know about, but mm -hmm. probably should. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, yesterday when I met you, I was like, fuck, the world is doing strange exactly. things sometimes. <laughs> Everything I've done that's great has been this way. Yeah, I know it's not me. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the universe. It's everything conspiring, coming together for this. And for this is not for me. It's now I'm contributing to this moment, to this. It's, we're, all, we're all the whole. Here's one thing we didn't talk about. Uh -huh. For you. There's a difference between perfection and perfect. Perfection is without flaw. And perfect is the best thing that there is. Perfect is whole and complete. Whole and complete includes errors, faults, because that's where the learning, the growth, everything comes from. Uh, so perfectionists have a hard time with um, having fault. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like they prefer to not have fault than to win. Mm -hmm. Winning, they want to win. And somewhere I believe they think uh, by being perfect, I'll win. But if they really came down to, if you could have a flawless performance and lose, would you choose that over a sloppy performance and winning? Mm -hmm. And mentally and emotionally and with the ego and everything, some people would choose the moment of perfection, mm -hmm. being without flaw to actually being successful. But whole and complete is, to win a tournament, you have to be whole and complete. You are not going to play your best every single match. You're not going to play your best every single point. But it's like the, the, the total is the sum of its parts. So all those ugly bits contribute to the win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it actually makes it more special. So, you know, if I look at it this way, if someone's like a perfect human being, never angry, never sad, never make a mistake, come from a very privileged place and never knew any challenges, and then they try to tell me how to do something, I'm like, well, that's great for you, and I appreciate how you are, but the reality is, it's, I can identify with someone who hasn't always succeeded, who has anger and joy, you know, happiness and depression. Someone who mm -hmm. has to choose. They know, oh, I can fall into this, you know, despair. 
if I allow myself to. Mm -hmm. Because it's right there on my shoulder, like a like an advisor, <laughs> like a friend, going, "Hey, you're one conversation away from feeling really bad." Mm -hmm. And so, what do I? What life do I have to create for myself? What mindset? What habits? What environment? People? Uh, missions? What do I have to create for myself so that I move? Focus on this instead of the friend who's right here, waiting for me to give it some attention. And so that's the whole and complete. The whole and complete is all of it coming together. And that's one of my, uh, again, these are all mental emotional skills that are needed for the journey of excellence. Because what I find in perfectionists is they never do anything that they don't imagine they can succeed in. And people who are perfectionists, who are high achievers, just are very unreasonable about what they think they can do. But as soon as they see something and they don't see a win it, they either try to change the rules, cheat, or they just don't do it. They will not face it. And someone with lesser abilities who um, has more courage in that moment can succeed where they fail because just because they give themselves to it fully. And the other person, they're finding a way out, you know, they need an excuse. The ego's like, oh, well, I didn't give myself to it fully, so I could do it if I had done it properly or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. There's, uh, yeah, so I think it's a real trap for excellence. And we beat people like this all the time where they're better, they're the best. But it's not the best who wins, it's the ones who play the best on the day. Mm -hmm. and yeah. That's why we're here now. Yeah. You know, like, people go, do they have a chance? Do they do this and that? Let's see. Yeah. I know they're going to be prepared to give their best. And if they can create an environment for the other people where they can't give their best, then they have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we're working on is serving. How do we disrupt passing? So if someone's a really good hitter, then we disrupt them off the serve, and the ball has to come from over their shoulder or they have the second contact isn't a solid contact, they can't use their strength. Now they have to shoot or they, they're under pressure. And we can manage that level of pressure, but if we let them pass and set every time, mm -hmm. by the end of the game, they're unstoppable. Oh. You know, so that's, so that's just, just things like that, how we switch the advantage into our favor when we should have no natural advantage. There's no natural advantage there. They're a great player. They pass, set, and they hit really well. There's no advantage. Okay, well, we have to disrupt something in that system. If we can do that, have they trained for that? Mm -hmm. If they haven't trained for it, now they're in a pressure moment. Then oh. it, it becomes exaggerated. It compounds. The pressure compounds because not only are they not performing, they don't know themselves not to perform, and it's happening consistently. Now they have to deal with it mentally and emotionally, and they have to deal with the relationship with the part. They got to do all this stuff mm -hmm. on the spot and they can't perform. And if we can get them in that safety space, then they just go into survival mode. Instead of thriving, they're mm -hmm. just trying to survive. And then they have a, what they think is a bad performance. It's not a bad performance. This is your best performance you can have in survival mode. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> or disrupted. Yeah. You haven't trained to be disrupted. Yeah. I love what you said before because that's what I do. As soon as my athletes can do something well, we have to disrupt it. Mm -hmm. And then they have to get back to performance. Yeah. And then, then we get to see, well, first of all, how are you disrupted? Was it the environment? Uh, was it something mental or emotional? Did we just speed it up too much? Was it physical? What was, what was the thing that was able to disrupt you? And then how did you get back? Mm -hmm. And then we turned that into a, we turned into a system or a method or something. We turned it into a technique. We attach it to maybe their breathing some thought, something that they can, it's tangible, that they can do. To get back. Yeah, it might just be. For the listeners, is <laughs> Swiping the eyebrows or clapping the hands or whatever it is, because now we have this trigger that's associated to this way of being, their phys physiology, their mindset, all this sort of stuff. They do the physical trigger and all the other stuff happens. Mm -hmm. It looks like a simple thing. It's pretty, and that's the Apple thing, right? So you don't have to know what's going on in the computer and how to code and stuff. You point and click. 
The yeah. end user, simple, point click. Yeah. But the system is sophisticated mm -hmm. so that it can be simple at the end user. And that's, so that's all we're trying to do is simplify it so when they're under pressure, it's point click. And they know, I can close my eyes and do this, so of course I can do it with my eyes open under pressure. Mm -hmm. Even if it fails a little bit, it's not gonna fail so much that I don't have an opportunity to win. Yeah. And they keep buying into those sort of belief systems and someone else gets there and goes and questions themselves and they're in this positive, empowered you know, state and the other person's going into fear and safety and mm -hmm. who cares how good they are? No, no. You can't access any of that. No. This is a semi-new thought, uh, which is so, you go into that fear, fear mode, let's call it that, and where you play worse. I guess one strategy is to, to make yourself get out of that mode and another strategy would be to learn to play in that mode, like learn to play some maybe some other tactics or whatever. Yeah. And actually this might be the same because maybe the, how you play in that mode is actually what's going to bring you back to confidence exactly. again. I agree. Uh, I agree. So you see there's no difference between those two paths or do you see that there's... <sighs> Again, the paradox. <laughs> no, I, I think they're the same. Uh, well, either they're parallel paths or they're different places on the path. But I think, yeah, it's it's getting to the same place, maybe in a different way. Um, the way I look at it is confidence and certainty are two different things. And um, people think, oh, I'm not supposed to be afraid. Are you kidding me? This is your lifelong dream. It's here. When else do you get to practice the Olympics? Mm -hmm. Most Olympians only go to one. Oh. Most of them don't win a medal. This is your lifelong mission to get to this moment, and you're not going to feel any certain way about it? <laughs> Come on. you got to be a human being. So now I feel this certain way. I'm nervous. I'm fearful, whatever. What do I do with that? Does it inspire me and drive me? Or does it, you know, do I shrink and, yeah. you know, the, uh, so I think exactly what you're talking about. Do I dig into it and embrace it and, and transcend it? And on the other end of it, now I'm like, oh, I've got through that. I'm unstoppable now, right? Mm -hmm. The way I like to look at it um, from a technical point of view is, let's say my hitting's average now. For whatever reason, it's just not working. So now I block. I dig, I serve, I focus on the other aspects of the game. Because oftentimes when one part goes, for whatever reason, they let the other parts go. Oh, maybe the dopamine in the brain is <laughs> maybe it's dopamine disappearing. In the brain. It's, you know? So that would be interesting. I gotta do some research on that, man. That's really interesting. But but so when we go when one part of the game is suffering, focus on the other parts that you know you can do and do those well. And then what starts to happen is because you build on success, the other part frees up and comes back online. What's up, Alex here again. So we are about halfway through the interview. So I will split the episode up into the second episode here and, and, and this one. I hope you have learned a lot. I hope you, there has been a lot of value and, and insights uh, in this. And uh, yeah, I don't know. There's not a there's never a perfect place to split an episode because we're we're in the middle of a conversation. But we'll continue in the next episode. Uh, so yes, if you have found this valuable, share this to other players, share this to friends so that they can listen to this also, and keep an eye out for the next episode. And uh, I'll put another little teaser into this. Uh, which is that in the next episode, we're actually talking about even more legends of the sport. And uh, I might actually have gotten more legends of the sport to be a part of the podcast, even as a follow up to this episode. So <laughs> that's the teaser. Uh, keep your eyes out for the next episode. Talk to you later.